So welcome everybody to this workshop on introducing Git and GitHub with my colleagues who will introduce themselves, I think is probably the best way to do that. Um, really looking forward to this. There's a lot of talk at the moment across the analytical world within the NHS and beyond into local authorities and civil service and government about using Git and GitHub. And this is a really excellent workshop that I'm really pleased to host for the NHSR conference 2023. We've also got, just to let you know, um, a couple of days next week, which are in person, but also recorded conference days of talks. So we'll have some excellent and exciting um, talks on a range of things from both R and Python, as well as maybe there might be a few about Git and GitHub that sneak into, which is great. So I'll pass over to Helen, who I think is going to be starting and do the introductions for you and Joe. Uh, yes, hello. Um, I'm Helen Richardson. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I will be delivering the first part of the workshop, Introduction to Version Control, Git, and, um, well, yeah, GitHub. Uh, and I've been a data scientist at, well, when I joined NHS England, the part of NHS England I joined was called NHS Digital, now it's called NHS England. But yes, I've been a data scientist for a few, year, for a few years now. Uh, primarily, I used to be at the RAP team and now currently I'm working on the CVD Prevent tool team. Um, and uh, yeah, Joe, would you like to give us a, an introduction as well? Okay. Yeah, hi there, I'm Joe. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Um, and uh, I'm a um, data scientist um, at NHS England. Um, I have been with, I joined NHS Digital back in um, uh, 2021 um, as a graduate trainee um, when I was on the graduate scheme for a couple of years. And um, about a year ago, I joined the RAP squads um, and have been working there ever since, and I'm still there. Um, so working on stuff like the National Diabetes Audit and um, the uh, Survey of Adult Social Care. Um, it's a couple of engagements that we've done. Um, yeah, be excited to do this workshop for you guys, and I'll be doing it in the, I'll be leading the afternoon bits. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, this is the second time we're running this workshop, so... Yeah, hopefully, hopefully things go as smoothly as last time. <laughs> um, so I'm going to um, share my screen and let's find out if that works. Um, uh, clicking share, is that? Okay, so that should be showing the Git training repository. Um, but I'm going to share my slides now, uh, see if that works as well. Just bear with me for a second. Uh -huh. Is that working? Is everything? Yes. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you. Right, yes. So in case you were wondering if you came to the wrong workshop, uh, yeah, this is uh, introduction to Git and version control and um, and GitHub. And it'll be presented by me and uh, Joe. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to switch slides. Okay, it's working. Um, yeah, so this is, again, who we are. Uh, this is how, what we look like. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide. And this is the uh, schedule. Yes, yeah, so a bit of housekeeping. So basically, we're going to start with the introduction to, like we said, version control, Git and GitHub. We're going to have a couple of short breaks, uh, a couple of 10 minute breaks between, in between practicals, just to make sure we, we can uh, have time to grab a cup of tea or, you know, just take a breather between the, uh, the exercises that we're going to uh, have a look at. Um, the, yeah, the final practical is the, eventually how we're going to, we'll learn how to use Git, GitHub and code spaces all at once. We, if you don't know what those things are, don't worry, we're going to have a look at those in a, a momentarily. Uh, roughly around 12 o'clock, ish noon time we're going to uh, attempt to have uh, a lunch break for about an hour 
And then the afternoon session is the Git collaboration part of the workshop, which is will also have allocated breaks and will be run by um, my colleague, uh, Joe. Um, in terms of the uh, workshop requirements, uh, not many things you need for this workshop. Uh, you will need uh, an internet connection, which I trust you already have that since you've joined the workshop. Uh, access to a browser, so you can access GitHub and obviously have a GitHub account, which is completely free. Um, so we will also have, I think at some point during, before the first practical, we can um, allocate time just to make sure that people have access to their GitHub accounts if they've created one. Um, so yeah, um, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so these are the learning objectives for today's workshop. So for the first part, we're going to look at what is version control. Uh, why is it uh, helpful? Uh, we're going to have a look at Git and GitHub and the differences between the two. Uh, we're also going to look at some um, kind of potentially strange terminology. So what is a repository? What are branches? What's a readme file? What's a git ignore file? Uh, we're also going to do a practical. We're going to learn how to apply version control to our projects using Git commands. Uh, we're also going to look at uh, how um, the first practical is basically how to create a repository. And we're also going to look, uh, use uh, a virtual machine, which is called Codespaces, which is basically Git, GitHub's version of, um, well, just to simplify it, it's basically GitHub's vir virtual machine in, in terms of being able to work directly through GitHub. Um, and then we have an afternoon session, again, run by Joe, and here we will learn how to submit a pull request on GitHub, and what does that mean, um, how to use Git collaboratively, so within a team setting, and also how to handle scary merge conflicts. Again, don't worry if you don't know what any of this means, we will have um, a detailed look at these items momentarily. So if I go to the next slide, cool. So this is my documents folder. This is how, uh, if you have a look at my computer, this is how my documents folder exactly uh, looks like. Um, so I'll just give you a few seconds to look at this. It's um, it's quite funny. I guess there can be moments where it's not very funny if you are dashing to do a presentation last minute and you're looking for your uh, your slides. <laughs> you're not sure which is the, the final version of the slides you're trying to use uh, because all the titles look similar. Um, so I feel like this image is something most of us are familiar with. Um, having so many different versions of essentially the same file, the same document uh, or the same slides, for example, if you're preparing for a presentation. Um, so the question here is how can we prevent this from happening? How can we help our documents folder look a bit more, um, I don't know, manageable, I guess is a word. <laughs> um, so this is where version control comes in. And basically version control is um, this lovely practice of tracking and managing any changes on the project's code. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be code. This can also be documents, documentation, uh, all kinds of different types of files and of course folders over time. And this allows you to observe um, a detailed history of the changes made in these um, files or, or folders and enables yourself uh, and your team members to collaborate on the same project. You don't have to necessarily work in a team to be able to use version control and Git. Again, this is, can be, uh, you might be working on a solo project or you might just want to be able to track changes in something you're working in. Um, how does it work in practice? Um, it's basically a two-step process if you kind of do it kind of like high top level um, overview of it. So basically the first part is you use Git, which is a software tool. So a version control software tool. And you don't you download that to your computer and you use that to um, assign a folder you're using to transform it as a working folder, your working folder into a Git project folder. 
So you take a folder you've been working in and you assign it as a Git project folder through Git, the software tool. And the second part of that is that that will allow us to track changes. So for example, if I start adding or deleting files in the, in the same folder, or if I'm changing the contents of my files, Git will automatically track everything because the folder has been assigned as a Git project folder. And the second step of the two-step process is that after we've done this, we then use an online version control system, also known as a Git hosting platform. There's all kinds of different names you can use for this. It's also called a Git service uh, platform. Uh, and this can be either GitHub. We're going to look at GitHub today, but there's also GitLab. There's There are a number of Git hosting platforms out there. There's also Gitbucket, for example. And we use GitHub to upload and store our Git project folders, which have the fancy name for them basically called uh, rep repositories. So two-step process, we, we use Git version control software tool. We assign the folder we've working, we're working in as a Git project folder. We track our changes and then we take, we use GitHub to upload our Git projects on the, um, on that website or platform or however you want to call it. <clears throat> so you might ask me, um, I mean, we saw the comic strip in the previous slide, but you might ask me, I mean, why why should I care about version control? Why is it so important? Why is it so helpful? Is it just to prevent that mess happening in my folders? Um, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of reasons why, there are a lot of benefits um, that come with using version control. Um, we've highlighted here like the most important ones in the slide. So for example, the first one, first and foremost is tracking changes uh, restoring previous versions if things break. So for example, if I accidentally make a change that I didn't want to make, I can always revert back to the previous version and there's absolutely no harm done. Uh, the second uh, highlight here is that uh, it, it, uh, it offers us the ability to review someone's changes and also the ability to leave comments. So it enhances collaborative working. Um, then we can also try out experiments without the risk of breaking our main code. Um, I would like to add here that even if things do break, we can always restore previous versions of our work. So again, no harm done, but it does also offer the opportunity to do this without breaking our code. But even if we do make the mistake, it doesn't matter. And of course, the last one um, is this used to be a very big problem back in the day, uh, avoid code being hidden away on someone's machine. So imagine if you're working on a last minute kind of publication, you're trying to push out something, a report uh, for NHS England, and for some reason, uh, the person who has the code, they've, they've gone on annual leave and their code is just on their computer and you can't access it. This used to be a real problem back in the day. Um, but since, um, well, since version control now tools and, for example, Git, um, this is not an issue anymore because work is stored on a platform that everyone can access and it's not locked away on someone's computer. Um, so we, yes, so we previously mentioned how using, applying version control is a two-step process, right? So we have Git, a software tool, and if we have a folder that, let's say we are developing some kind of code on our computer, we assign that folder as a Git project folder, and then we track our changes. And then once we're ready, we can upload that Git project onto GitHub. And that's called a repository once you put it on GitHub. So how do repositories work in general? So in Git, each user has a copy of the entire repository which is also known as the project's working directory or the project's folder on the computer. And this is considered generally like, like the offline mode of way of working basically. Or you don't have to use your computer. Nowadays, a lot of people use virtual machines and which is what we're going to do today in our, in a, for our workshop as well because Codespaces is a virtual machine. Uh, so the idea is that you download a copy of the repository and then you can work separately offline until you opt to push your changes, the updated version of the code or the files you're working on, the documentation you're working on, back to the remote online version of the repository. 
And the, word, the phrase remote repositories, it basically what it means is that it's versions of your project that are hosted on an online version control system. So at NHS England, for example, we store our Git projects on GitLab, which is for internal users. And then we use GitHub every time we wish to publish our code. So kind of it's basically to recap, because I understand that this can be a bit tricky to kind of um, to grasp. All repositories, all remote repositories are basically online and they exist on, a, on an online kind of version control system. And this can also be called a Git hosting service or a Git hosting platform. It's basically a website. And that's what GitHub is or GitLab. And the idea is that each user, every time they wish to make a change or work on a project, they download a copy of that repository, either on their computer or a virtual machine. They make their changes, they carry out their work, and then once they're ready, they push back these changes back to GitHub. So that's how it works in a nutshell. Um, the next, oh, okay, cool. Right, so for the next part, we're going to try and make sense of all of what we just kind of uh, talked about. And we're also going to do the first practical of the day. And after that, we're going to take a break. So. We're going to take a look and see in practice what repositories actually look like. We'll also do a first hands-on exercise, which is creating a repository. So we're going to create our first repository on GitHub. Now, I would like to just put a disclaimer here, just in case. Um, so there are different ways of learning and you're very much welcome to tag along and do the exercises at the same time um, as me and, and Joe, of course um later for the afternoon session um or you can do the exercises after the workshop uh you can do it or maybe some other time or during the weekend maybe uh while watching the recording and or you can just simply follow the guides we have um instructions for these practicals uh we will share the links um so either way it's absolutely fine and yeah just you do you basically <laughs> so uh, we're going to move on to the example of a remote online repository. So I'm just going to stop sharing my slides and I'm going to move on to the um, repository that we've prepared for this workshop. Hang on a second, just stop sharing. I'm going to dismiss all these annoying notifications. And um, Joe, uh, could you kindly share the link to the repository in the chat? Because I can't see the chat for some reason. Of course, sure. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Cool. Okay, I'm just going to give people a chance to um, go on, um, access the link, and also log into GitHub if you if you would like to do so. Um, just making sure that I have my notes. Just trying to see if there's a way for me to um, access the chat. Oh, let's put it over here. Okay, cool. Right, so, um, yeah, if anyone is having any issues with accessing GitHub for any reason in particular, or you can't create an account for some reason, please let us know in the chat and we will have a look. Um, so this is a, well, first of all, we have signed in on GitHub and I've signed in on my account. You can see my profile picture on the top right. Um, and what we're looking at right now is a repository on GitHub. And the entirety of this page is basically called the landing page of the repository. And you might wonder why my version of GitHub looks like this. I'm using GitHub in dark mode. Um, and it's very likely that you're using GitHub in light mode. Um, to change that, you just click on your profile picture and then you go to uh, settings, I believe, and that's where you can switch back between dark mode and light mode. 
Um, I know that there's a setting you can change through the browser as well. I know that people have add-ons for that as well. So yeah, feel free to play around with settings however you um, you'd like. So um, as we can see here, the first thing to notice that the name of the repository is going to be here on the top left. So this is called git underscore training. So this repository is dedicated to the training workshop session that we've prepared for today. And the owner of this repository is, you can see here on the top left, is the NHSR community. And if you click on that, um, well, first of all, if you hover your, your mouse over the, oh, it's disappeared. There we go. It also has a, like a little description. It gives you a bit of information of who the owner is. And it also shows you how many repositories they have. They have 49 repositories. So they have 49 Git projects on, uh, on GitHub. And yeah, the quite busy uh, community on GitHub. So we looked at the owner, we looked at the name. Another interesting thing to notice about this repository is that it's public. You can see the public tag right here next to the name. Um, obviously, if it was private, it would have said private. Um, there's, there's different kinds of tags you can add in terms of the visibility levels of your repository. Um, and because we're using uh, the repository for the workshop, the purposes of the workshop, it's public. On the right hand side, we have the about section, which is basically it gives you some extra bits of information on the repository. So, for example, we have a nice little description here uh, Git training for the NGSR community. We've added a couple of tags here one is training, and one is called the other one's called training materials. And the reason for tags is that maybe uh, later on, somebody could go on the search bar function here and they could type training or they could type training materials. And this repository will show up in their, in their search results. Um, some of these uh, pieces of information here are not applicable at the moment to us. Um, I'll just go further down just out of interest to see if there's anything else we can look at here. The contributors, these are the amount the um, developers who've contributed to the uh, repositories, um, to the workshops repositories. So you can see my name, you can see Joe's name, you can see Harriet, who's also a data scientist in our team, and you can see Chris, who's part of the NHSR community. Another interesting thing about this is that GitHub really likes to tell you um, the programming languages that have been used for the repository. So you can see that about 54% of the repository is uh, written used in, um, it's written in Python, and the rest is uh, is using the uh, R language. So back to the um, main part of the repository, we can see here in the middle. So we have three folders. So one is called guides, one is called images, another one is called practice underscore scripts, and then we have three files. We have a git ignore file, we have a license, and we have a readme.md. So we have these three files. And the way it basically works, like the layout of the repository, it's exactly the same when you open Windows Explorer on your computer to access your um, pictures or your downloads. It's exactly the same idea. So for example, if I click here on uh, images, it's going to open the images folder. And inside, there'll be a bunch of images, which we used to create the um, workshops guides, basically. Um, and if I, I can go back using the uh, back button, or I can just click back here on Git Training, I can click here on the two dots here on this little folder icon, and it will take me back to the uh, main layout of the repository. So I can go back to another folder, for example, I can go to practice scripts, and I can look at the practice scripts in here. Um, so I'm just going to go back to the main page of the repository by clicking on git underscore training. So navigating through the repositories folders is exactly the same as navigating through your files on your computer. It's exactly the same logic. And the other things to notice here is that there are three files. So we'll start with the first one, which is the readme file. And this is one of the most important files that um, you will basically see when you access, uh, not just this repository, but every repository you access on GitHub should have a readme file. And that's because a readme file is often the first item a visitor will see when they visit your repository. 
And they will typically have a description of your project, a description of your repository. So for example, as you can see here, welcome to the NHSR community repository for good training. We are using version control. It's a fundamental skill for any uh, developers. It provides tons of benefits for, your, for yourself and for your projects. And then we have instructions for how to use all kinds of things for the uh, purposes of the of the workshop. Now, the other, the other repositories which uh, they serve as code bases for uh, different kinds of projects, maybe uh, for Android apps, uh, for all kinds of applications and features. If you're using Python or R, uh, most of the libraries will have repositories on GitHub where you can access and have a look at the code. And everything to do with the the repository's description, every, anything to do with the uh, how to run the code, how to contribute to the project, all of that information will be in the readme, which will automatically load every time you open a repository because GitHub will recognize that you have a readme file in your repository. Then the other thing to notice um, here is the license. So if we click on the license, so you might ask me why do we why are we using a license for GitHub or for our projects? So basically, the idea behind um, the, the reason for using licenses is every time you have a public repository, so a public facing repository on GitHub, these repositories are often used to share open source code or open source software. If you if you want your, uh, if you'd like your repository to be truly open source, you need a license so others can know that they can use anything you have in your repository. It's free to use, and it's also something they can reuse for their own projects, and they can also distribute the software. Um, the reason that we, I mean, you could have a public repository without a license, if you are expecting your repository to be used by other people, I would highly recommend to have a license because I think in the UK, I'm not uh, a legal expert, but I think in the UK, you can sue somebody for using, uh, sue for copyright purposes. Uh, if someone is using uh, your intellectual property, if, if they don't have a license. Um, I know it's different for EU, um, uh, EU laws and United States, etc. But the UK, I think it's always best to kind of use a license if you have a public repository. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying that you know it's a, it's a good idea to have a, a license. Um, and also, GitHub has this very cool interactive feature here, where if you can't be bothered to read the entire terms and conditions here of the license, it has a nice little summary here of the permissions, limitations, and all kinds of like terms and conditions that apply to the specific. Um, license. And the final file to look at is the gitignore file, which is one of my favorite files in terms of uh, git. So basically this file, now it might look quite gibberish to you at the moment, but basically this file, what it does is a list. And it's a, it's a file that contains a list of other files. And it's basically a configuration file and its job is, is to let Git know which files to ignore, um, which files to ignore in order to in order to prevent them from being uploaded to um, on GitHub. So what this means in practice is that, for example, if you are working on a Git project on your computer and you have access to data, and say you're using a CSV file that contains uh, maybe some kind of sensitive data, for example, um, then you can add the CSV file format to this list. So for example, so in line 16, we have the R environment variables. On line 17, we can add .csv. And after we, we close that, we, we save and we close that file, every time we wish to upload any kind of changes back to GitHub, Git will read this list and it will go line by line. It will look at our history, it will look at our data, etc. It will reach like a line 17 or 18. It will notice that we've added the CSV file format and it will say, oh, okay, Helen doesn't want me to upload CSV files back to GitHub, so I'm going to completely ignore these files. Um, 
So this is a great way to avoid accidentally sharing data or uploading data uh, on GitHub, for example. So it's a really, really fantastic safeguard. Cool. So now we're going to move on to the first exercise, first practical of the uh, workshop, which is to create our first Git and subsequently GitHub repository. Um, I'm going to share the link of the exercise in the chat. And let me know if that doesn't work for some reason. Um, feel free to ask any questions, by the way, if something is not clear um, or if something doesn't make sense. Um, let me. Okay, so I'm just making sure that everything is cool. Right, so. Um, cool, so how to create a repository. So I'm also going to be going through the uh, instructions at the same time. Um, so just to make sure I'm not going off, you know, doing my own thing. <laughs> so how to create a repository on GitHub. This guide will show you how to create a repository on GitHub. So first of all, log in into your GitHub account or create one if you don't have one. Secondly, it says click on the plus icon located right next to your profile picture on the top right. So if I go all the way to the top right where my profile picture is, there's a plus symbol and it's one, two, three, four here. There it is. And if I click on it, on step three, it says you will be presented with a few options. Um, so I'm clicking on it. It says, unless you're importing a template repository, opt for new repository. So we're not importing a new repository. We're just going to create a new repository from scratch. Uh, but as you can see, it has many other options. For now, we're going to just ignore them and we're just going to click new repository. Okay. And then step four, it says, entering the new repository display. Um, so it has a, a few steps here and it's basically following the create a new repository instructions as well, uh, step by step. So I'm just gonna move on back to this page. And the amazing thing about GitHub is, is that they have lots of, um, there are lots of helplines along the way. So if you're doing something for the first time, so for example, creating a new repository in this instance, they have so many tidbits of information and links and all kinds of um, assistance in case you don't remember if like specific item, uh, like whatever it is you're doing, what it is and what it does. So we're just gonna go line by line here and just pretend that we don't remember what each item does. So create a new repository. A repository contains all project files or project folders, including the revision history. Uh, already have a project repository somewhere else, import a repository. We don't have a project repository somewhere else. We're gonna create a new one, a fresh one from scratch. Um, okay, so it wants us to uh, complete the fields that are marked with an asterisk. Okay, I'm just gonna scroll a bit further down. I'm going to ignore the single sign-on. Um, repository templates. So, it says here, start your repository with a template repository's contents. If I click on this drop down menu, because I'm part of uh, a couple of other groups on GitHub, so one of them is Anxious England, the other one is Anxious Digital, there are some repositories that have they've been created. Um, they've been created just uh, as templates, basically, and what that means is that they they can be they can be reused. Um, as repositories by others. So for example, um, they might not have actually any kind of code or documentation, but it's just that the structure is something that I might uh, require for my uh, project. We don't need any kind of templates at the moment. So I'm just gonna click and confirm no template. Um, the next item is the owner, so who's going to be the owner of the repository. If I click on this drop down again, I have a few options I have myself, and then I have a few other options, which are basically groups that I've, I'm a member of on GitHub. I'm going to ignore them and I'm just gonna select myself. 
Um, and then repository name, this can be anything you like. It can be your uh, your pet's name. <laughs> it can be your football team you support. It can be anything you like. I'm just going to name it as my repository. And it also has like a little uh, uh, disclaimer here. Great repository names and are short and memorable. Need inspiration. How about ideal parakeet? Uh, so it's giving you, it, it will probably have a different kind of suggestion for uh, each and every one of you. Um, cool. Description, this is optional. Uh, this will be a description of your repository. So for example, if you're working on creating an Android app, then the description will be this repository is to create blah, 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 Android app. Um, I'm just going to add a description and I'm just going to reuse one I used earlier just for purposes of practicing the workshop. So this repository is a practice repository for the NHSR workshop. Public versus private. So if you don't know what these things mean, it has, again, a short explanation. Public, anyone on the internet can see this repository. You choose who can commit. We will look at what commitment means momentarily, so you don't have to worry about that right now. But basically, the first sentence is what we like to kind of uh, take notice of is, yeah, so anyone can see, anyone can access this repository, or you can go private where only yourself can see the repository. But then you can also invite other collaborators to your project. So it can be you and maybe a couple of others who have access to the private repository. I'm going to keep this public. Um then we have a question about the readme file. So we saw what a readme file was a few moments ago. If you don't remember what that is, again, it has a little explanation here. It says, this is where you can write a long description for your project, learn more about readme, readmes. So GitHub, that link will take you to GitHub's documentation. And if you click on it, in general, I think, Personally, I think GitHub document the GitHub doc oh, sorry GitHub's documentation is is really well written and it's really elaborate and they do cover almost everything. I mean, any question I've had on in terms of GitHub, I've it's been answered through the documentation. And it's um, yes, it's, it's really it's really good and highly recommended if you get stuck if you don't remember what something does uh, like a specific file what it does on GitHub. Just look through the GitHub documentation and it should have everything uh, answered for you. So as we mentioned previously, um, readmes will contain a description of your project. Um, so I will add a readme, so I can then add a description of my project later on. The git ignore file, again, if you don't remember what that is, choose which files to not track from a list of templates. Uh, it's a configuration file, the git ignore file, and it tells Git to ignore files to prevent them from um, being uploaded back to GitHub. And yes, you can have unlimited free private repositories on GitHub. I didn't know that. That is, that's really cool. I think there's a limitation on the public ones. Um, but yeah, I didn't know about the free private repositories. That's, that's really cool. Um, again, if you don't remember what Git ignore files are. Oh, there's a nice, lovely link here. If we click on the Git ignore template, um, you will notice that it has a very long list of all kinds of programming languages uh, that you can uh, select from. So, for example, if you're de developing uh, a project using Julia, or if you're developing a project using uh, Python or R or um, Ruby, Rust, all kinds of like, all of the, as you can see, there's so many programming languages here. Um, then each programming language, as you can see, has its own equivalent uh, git ignore file template. Uh, and it's a template because it usually contains the most ignored files that um, you would expect it to contain, um, but all, you can always customize it and add other files. So for example, as you saw in the previous R git ignore file, we could we can add a CSV file, for example, if we want git to ignore CSV files. I'm going to select Android because I'm going to pretend that I'm an Android developer and I'm creating an Android app. So I've just added the git ignore template for Android. 
And I'm going to choose a license. Again, if you don't remember what that is or what it does or what it means, it has a nice little explanation here. License tells others what they can and what they can't do with your code or your documentation. And again, a link to uh, what to learn more about licenses. And if you click on the drop down, it has a list of licenses. Um, so in terms of um, when it comes to licensing best practice, um, it is recommended to use the MIT license um, because th the whole purpose of the MIT license, it's basically a one size fits all kind of license. So that's why it's also like in terms of best practice, it's the recommendation. Um, however, you might be doing something very specific. Uh, obviously, in agreement with your workplace, you might have different kind of license in place. Um, I'm going to choose the MIT license. And I'm just going to add here that at NHS England, if we have a repository, if we have a Git project that has code, we use the MIT license. However, if we also have documentation, we use the open government license and specifically um, version three, which is specifically uh, for public sector documentation and information. And I'm going to link this in the chat in case anyone wants to read the uh, terms and conditions of the um, open government license and what you're free to do. Cool. So I'm going to go back. So we've clicked everything. We've done everything that was uh, mandatory to complete. And it's giving us a nice little warning here at the end. You are creating a public repository in your personal account. Yes, this is, this is what I'm aiming to do. So I'm going to click Create Repository. And it only took a couple of seconds to load. And as you can see, I have my repository, this is the title of the repository I indeed used. And you can see my username here on the top left. And it's uh, because the repository belongs to, to myself. And as you can see, it has that little about me section, uh, about me, about section here of the description of the repository. This repository is a practice repository for our community. And it also has those three files that we just added. So it has the git ignore, which if I click on it, it should be the uh, Android git ignore file because I was pretending to be an Android developer and indeed it is the Android one. I don't understand what half of these mean but I assume it's um, very important files, configuration files to do when developing using Android. And if I go back to the uh, top level of my repository, indeed we have the license. Um, if I click on it, it should be the MIT license. Indeed it is the MIT license and if I don't want to read this uh, massive, well, it's not massive text, but if I don't want to read this text, um, this text document, then I can just look at the interactive um, nice little summary of the license up here. And then I can go back to the, uh, again, top level of my repository. And there's the readme. I don't have to click on it because as we previously mentioned, GitHub, uh, any kind of Git hosting service, every time there's a readme file in your Git project, it will automatically load it for you. So we can see here, my repository, this repository is a practice repository for Fringes Arc Workshop. It's automatically copy pasted the uh, description. So we have successfully created um, a repository, our first repository on GitHub. And we are going to take, um, let me just quickly go back to um, sharing the slides. Yeah, so we're gonna take a 10 minute break now because that was uh, a lot to digest. And we'll come back at um, uh, half past 10, let's say half past 10. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in a bit. We'll also be in the chat, by the way, if you have any questions. So uh, yeah, see you soon.
How's it going, Joe? <laughs> yeah, good, thank you. Um, just answering the questions in the chat. Uh, um, cool, yeah, let me have a look at the chat as well. And let me see. Felix is asking, as the open government license is not on the list of licenses on the drop down menu, yeah, how do you use it for the repository? That's a very good question. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so I can respond to that question as well. I've also gone to the Brat Community Practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great minds think alike. Um, yeah, no, that's a very good question because um, it's not just the open government license, but if your workplace is using a very specific license that's not on the list, like how do you, how do you deal with that? So basically, um, if I go back to the repository I just created, just uh, to just for simplicity initially. Um, so the readme file here, this is a markdown file. And what basically that what that means is that you can edit this file in any way you like. Like you can do all kinds of um if I if I click on the edit button here, for example. So you can edit this file directly on GitHub. And this is the editor mode and I can start typing. I can, you know, just start typing whatever I want to type. And basically anything in terms of licenses that you'd like to add, then you can add them here basically on the readme. And I'll show you an example as well. I'm just go back and just cancel my changes and show you the RAV community of practice repository that we have. Okay, so this is the RAP Community of Practice repository. Uh, I think Joe will also talk about this later and uh, during the afternoon session. But if I scroll all the way down, so this repository is using both the MIT license for the code, for the repository's code. And it's using the, because there's a lot of documentation on this repository, it's using the open government license version three. If I scroll all the way down, as you can see here, first of all, if I, look at the license file if i click on it it's the mit license and if i scroll all the way down uh, i'm just going to quickly click on it just so i can show it to you guys um and i'm just gonna um, just go over here yeah so it's the mit license if i go back if I scroll all the way down to the readme, you can see here at the bottom, it says license. And it says, unless stated otherwise, the code base is released under the MIT license, and it links back to the license we just looked at. And this covers both the code base and any sample code in the, um, well, in the documentation and the repository, basically. And uh, so just a few bits of information and then everything, all the documentation is available under the terms of the open government license. And that links back to the link that I put in the chat earlier. So if you wish to add any kind of license that's not part of the GitHub template licenses, you can just add it as a link to the readme. And um, if you completely do not want to use MIT or any kind of the template licenses, you can always just create your own license file as well and just copy paste any kind of legal text into that file, basically. I hope that answers the question. Um, let me see if I've lost the chat for some reason. Mm -hmm. Yep, cool. Um, yes, you can have more than one license per uh, repo. It, it really depends on, on, on what you're, uh, what you're trying to achieve. Um, cool. So, um, oh, another thing I was going to do 
is that I forgot to share my the link to my slides earlier. They're also part of the Git training repository. I'm just going to share them in the chat just in case it's uh, helpful for anyone to look at at the same time. And if you open that link, it's going to take you to this page. And then you can just start scrolling through the slides and stuff. Uh, if I go further down, I think it won't automatically load the entire, like all the slides in the um, in the preview. You just have to click load more at some point. Like there's an um, there's a collapse button basically to load the rest of the, the slides. But yeah, so everything should be there. Cool. All right. Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna go back to our slides. Um, let me just share my slides again. All right, we had a ten minute break. Cool. So this is um yeah. So we're just gonna recap a little bit here. Um, so when it comes to Git versus GitHub, um. We're going to see how Git works exactly in practice in the next practical, but um, it's important to remember that there are distinct differences between the two of them. And to kind of recap what we previously mentioned about Git and GitHub, I mean, there are a lot of differences, but basically the, the important ones to remember here is that Git is a software, it's a tool, and Git focuses on managing code and file history and tracking changes in a folder, and it's installed on your computer, or it's installed on your virtual machine. And then GitHub is basically it's a website, right? Like as we just as we previously saw during the uh, first practical, it's a service, it's a platform, it's a yeah, it's a hosting service for Git projects, for Git repositories, and it's available online. And there are, of course, other Git hosting services. We mentioned like GitLab, GitLab it's GitBucket, et cetera. But the, the important thing to remember, just to kind of like oversimplify things, is that Git is a tool that makes things appear on GitHub, basically. Um, okay, right. So back to <laughs> this familiar image, as we saw at the start, of the uh, like one of the first slides that we looked at. Um, so we saw what a repository is. We saw what a Git project is on, on GitHub. We also saw how to, uh, we, we created one ourselves. So where do we go from here? And like the uh, comic strip we previously uh, looked at, how do we exactly prevent this chaos <laughs> from happening in our documents folder. So what is what, what's exactly stopping us from having from uploading all these files in the GitHub repository we just created, for example? And most importantly, how can Git help prevent this comic strip from happening in our Git repository that we just created? So this is a tree branch. Uh, I think we, we all know what a tree branch is and how it looks like. We've all probably touched one, maybe. Um, so in Git, we, uh, we use the concept of branches as a solution to the comic strip that we saw in the previous slide. So how do tree branches, um, how, how, do, how, does, how, how does that translate in Git? How do exactly tree branches appear in Git? So branch is in Git is another word for version. It's basically the same word. It's just another word for version. So usually when we are developing, um, I mean, when we're writing a document or we are creating slides for a presentation, as we previously saw in that comic strip, we're going to have, most likely, we're going to have numerous versions of the same slide. So we may, maybe with small differences or maybe with major differences. Um, by using different branches or versions of the same code, 
or document or slides or any type of file that you're working on, we can um, safely work and test and do all kinds of changes we'd like to um, make to our files without breaking or changing our files significantly, um, which all these files will basically reside in the default main branch of the repository. Now, there are not lots of unknown words I just said in that sentence, but we will have a look at this in just a second. So I'm just going to repeat this by using different branches or versions of the same code. So for example, if we're focusing on developing some code for an Android app, for example, we can safely work and test without breaking our main code or file that resigns in the default main branch of the repository. So by creating different versions, different copies of the main copy, main, sorry, main version of our code, we can test all kinds of things without affecting the original version. So in Git, we use the word main as the name of the default version, the original version, if you if you like to call it like, a, if you want to use that terminology as well, the, the default version or default branch of our Git project repository. Now you might see main differently worded. So for example, you might see the word master. So instead of main branch, you might see master branch, or you might see dev branch, which is short for developer or developing. So how does it work in practice? How do branches work in practice? So let me actually add the uh, laser pointer as well. And uh, I guess try and keep your cats away from the, the screen. <laughs> um, cool. OK, so the idea here is that the green line represents the main build of your work. OK, so this will be branch number one. And this can be either code or it can be a document. It can be any type of file that you're working on. Um, each circle represents a change that's been made to the version of your files. I would ignore the circles here in the middle at the moment. It's like um, It's probably a little bit distracting. But uh, that's what the circles represent in this um, in this image. So suppose we are a big team. Uh, so suppose in this call, we all are a big, big team. We all work together. And suppose we are all working on the same document. And in order to avoid messing with the main version of the document, I will create a new branch. I'm going to create branch number two the blue branch here, and this will be a copy. This is a copied version of the green branch of branch number one, which is the main branch. And I'm creating this new branch because this is where I will carry out my work. And I don't mind, I don't want my work to affect, I don't, I don't want to affect the main branch. And I don't want to make any mistakes. I don't want to accidentally delete something that's important. Um, so that kind of stuff. Um, so I've created branch number two, the blue branch. This is where I'm carrying out my work. And perhaps I'm rewriting some sections of the document. Maybe I'm adding new sections to a document. Maybe I'm adding uh, new chapters. And while I'm making my changes, each circle is representing a change I'm making to my document. I'm adding new chapters, new sections, etc. So while I'm working on my document, on my version of the uh, document, my branch, uh, my colleague, Joe, has also picked a ticket to work on this document. So Joe has also created a branch, a new branch, which is branch over here, number three, which is the orange one. Okay, so this is where Joe has created his own branch and he's applying his own changes. And while Joe is working on his own branch, I have completed work on my own branch. And at this point here, I'm merging my work at this point with the main version of the document, so the green branch. Before merging, there will be a review process to check that my work has met the correct criteria and I haven't gone completely off the charts. And once all that is done and merged, then Joe, in a similar fashion, will merge at this point here, his own branch, branch number three, back to branch number one. And he will merge his own work 
uh, with with the with the main document also following um, a review process. So to recap on the concept of working uh, with branches, we have the main branch here in green, which contains the default and main version of our work. And, and then to avoid messing with that, I'm creating a copy, branch number two, the blue branch. And I'm carrying out my work here in branch number two. In the meantime, Joe is creating, he does exactly the same. He creates his own branch in orange. And after respective review processes, we eventually merge our branches. I merge my branch at this point, and then Joe merges his branch with the green main branch. So this is how Git branches work in a nutshell. And we are going to see this in practice. The slides, uh, the link I put in the chat also have the slides to this. So if you want to look at this during the practical, um, it, it's very helpful to see this image um, when you sort of first using branches for the first time, basically. Um, cool. So um, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. OK. Um, Cool. So, um, next steps now are so we're going to look. We're going to go back to GitHub. We're going to uh, fork a repository, and what fork means is basically a fancy word for copying a repository. So we're going to copy a repository on GitHub. We are going to um, do the next practical, which is we're basically going to learn how to create branches so we can work in our in our own branch. We're going to make changes to files. We are going to use um, Git while doing all this. We're going to use Git commands. And then eventually, once, once we're happy with our changes, we're going to push these changes back to the GitHub repository. We're also going to use Codespaces, which is GitHub's uh, virtual machine to do the above. And we're also going to put the link with the instructions to the practical in the chat. Um, but first, we're going to take a, another 10 minute break um, because I do understand that the um, slides, the, the things we just talked about can be a bit difficult to digest. So I'm just gonna give everyone 10 minutes to kind of have a look at that and, and, and think about it. And um, also to go back to GitHub and I'm also going to share the link to the instructions. Uh, feel free to ask any questions as well. Um, but um, yeah, I will see everyone back in, let's say, 11 o'clock. Yeah. I'll see you at 11.
I'm just going to give everyone a few minutes, well, a couple of minutes to um, come back. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to use the chat. Um, if there's anything that could, that's confusing you at the moment, um, it, it is is quite a steep learning curve when it comes to Git and version control. So, um, yeah, feel free to <laughs> ask any questions. It's, uh, it can be confusing. And I've also shared in the chat, I've shared the instructions for the next part of the practical. Um, but yeah, just give people a couple of minutes to come back. Cool. So, um, I've put in the chat a link to the um, instructions for the next part of the practical. And I have also the link open on my screen at the moment. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, more than happy to uh, answer them. It, as we previously mentioned, Git, introduction to Git, version control. These are quite confusing topics and it's, um, <laughs> it, it's expected to, to, to have to, uh, to have many questions about these uh, various kind of concepts, so. Um, so yeah, let's have a look at the link I just shared, which is the, uh, basically instructions to the, uh, main practical of the morning session. So the first part is talking about instructions for code spaces. Now, I understand that there might be, uh, people, uh, in the, uh, call who don't want to use code spaces for, and they would rather use their own computer. They, they want to use R and R studio desktop or even R studio cloud. Um, all they want to use, uh, the, the Python equivalent. That's absolutely fine. We have links for that as well. If you want to follow the guide, um, that there, we have different guides, um, for those, um, for those instances. Um, but we're going to follow the first part, which is the instructions for code spaces, which is basically um, GitHub's virtual machine for those who don't know what code spaces is, just to simplify what it what code spaces um, what it does. So the first uh, point in the, num the first step in instructions for code spaces says create your repository. So we've created a repository already. The repository we created is not going to be used for this practical. Uh, we're going to use the Git training uh, repository. And the way we're going to use that is we're just going to fork it. So we're just going to create a copy of that, uh, of the Git training repository. I'm going to show you how to do that. So we're going to do that together. Um, but there is also instructions in of like, the link we've attached here for this repository. This will take you to GitHub's uh, own documentation where it tells you how to fork a repository if uh, if it's confusing. Um, and then the, the third step will be to create our own code spaces session with the forked repository. So the copied repository that we've created 
and then we'll follow the steps in the uh, Git guide that we have. Again, all these links, um, I'll be following the exact same instructions um, as you guys, so don't worry, I'm not going to go and do my own thing. Um, so I'm just going to move this to another monitor so I can look at it at the same time. And I'm going to uh, go back to the Git training uh, repository. I'm just going to share the link again in the chat for those who, for some reason, have lost the link. And I'm going to create a copy. I'm going to fork this repository. So that that's what fork means. I'm just going to copy this repository. And I'm going to sign it to myself. So I'm going to be the owner of the copied repository. And the reason we do this, you might ask, why don't we directly work on the actual repository? Is because we would have to um, add every single user as a contributor to the repository. And that's probably going to take a long time for us to do so. So the easiest way is just for everyone who wishes to partake in the uh, exercise is to just create a copied version of this repository. And then you can do with that. You can do whatever you want with a copy. So I'm just going to go all the way here to the right. And I'm going to click on fork. And as you can see, it says fork your own copy. So create your own copy. So I'm going to click on it. And it's going to show you uh, a, a screen, which is, so this display here is very similar to the one we previously looked at when we were creating a repository. Again, it has a little explanation here of what a fork is. So it's a copy of a repository. And forking a repository allows you to freely experiment with changes without affecting the original project. You can fork, um, as far as I know, you can fork most public repositories. There are settings like in the repositories, individual settings, there is a setting where you can turn off uh, forking. So if you don't want users to fork your repository, but as far as I am aware, most repositories, you can do that. Um, so I'm going to assign the new copy to myself. Oh, fork already exists. Hang on a second. I'm just going to go quickly to my profile. Um, because it looks like I already have a forked version. I do have a forked version of the repository. Okay, so I created this one yesterday. Well, I was just testing to see if it worked. I'm just going to quickly delete it. And this is uh, how you delete a repository. Um, so what I did is I went to I'm just going to go back to show you how to delete a repository in case you're wondering. Just So this is the forked repository that I created yesterday. And if I go to settings and then I scroll all the way down, there's the danger zone here. <laughs> and if I go to the last option, it says delete this repository. So I'm just going to quickly delete it. It's giving me a lot of warnings. Unexpected back thing, bad things will happen if you, if you don't read this. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> And I'm just going to have to type the entire name. OK, I'm deleting. And I have to go through the Authenticator app because um, I have two-factor authentication enabled on my account. And there we go. So I've deleted the um, so I've deleted the I've deleted the forked uh, repository so now I can create a new one. So I'm just going to go back to the git training repository and I'm going to click fork. And yes, now it's going to let me do it. So I'm just going to change the name of the repository and I'm just going to say git training forked okay you can call it you know you can use whatever name you like to use um description I'm not going to change that copy the main branch only yes I'm, I, I only wish to copy the main branch that's fine and it says a little warning here you're creating a fork in your personal account so I'm going to create fork 
and it's taking a few seconds because it's copying the repository. And there we go. We have a public facing repository. It's Git training forked and it says it's forked. So it's copied from NHSR community, Git training, and I'm the owner. And it's exactly the same repository. Um, just checking the chat to see if everything is okay. Um, Sophie, okay, you've fixed that. Okay, cool. Awesome. Right, cool. So we have completed the steps number two. So now we're going to create a code spaces session. So now we're going to boot the uh, virtual machine. And the way to do that is you go all the way here to this lovely green button that says code. And it says no code spaces, which it makes sense, right? Because we haven't created a virtual machine yet. We haven't created a session. So we're going to click the nice big green button that says create code space on main. So this might take a few seconds, uh, depending on how code spaces feels about whatever it is we're trying to achieve. <laughs> Okay, it seems like it's still loading. Yep, still loading, okay. I think it's stopped loading now, it should be, should be okay. Cool. Now, this, again, this might look different to your version because I'm using dark mode. Um, again, this is something that you can change in the settings. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the interface before we start doing anything, because if if you have if you've used a VS Code, which is an IDE editor, so basically an editor to um, write code and create all kinds of code scripts, etc. If you've used VS Code before, this is basically um, it's exactly like VS Code. It works exactly like VS Code. If you haven't used VS Code, um, don't worry about it. We're going to talk about the interface, like what each panel does and the purpose of each panel. I'm also going to share a link to um, developing in code spaces. This is GitHub's own documentation. Um, in case it's easier uh, for you to read that in your own time. Um, but basically, the documentation is very is very well defined in terms of explaining um, you know, what codes, code, code spaces are and what they do. So, um, looking at this interface, this panel here, which is called Explorer, this is the it's called the sidebar. But basically, if you look at it, is exactly the same. Um, structure as the repository that we just copied, right? So we have the guides folder, there's the images folder, there's the practice scripts folder, there's the git ignore file. So if I click on that, if I double click on that, it's gonna open a new tab here, which has the list of all the files that Git is supposed to ignore. Um, there's a license as well. If I click on it, you can see the license and there's, there's, there's the readme as well. Okay, so this is the, um, so the Explorer panel contains all the files and folders that we have in our repository. And if I go next to the, well, this panel, this sidebar here, this is called uh, the activity bar. And basically this has like further options for you to kind of navigate through. So for example, it has a search function. So for example, if you're looking for something specific in your code, like if you've written, if you have many code scripts and you're trying to find a specific function or a specific word, and uh, if there's a lot of like lots of documentation in your repository, uh, or you just simply want to look for a specific uh, file or folder, you can just use this search functionality. And there are different other options here, but these are not applicable to our workshop today. This is the, debug this is the debugger, so if you want to test uh, various aspects of your code. Extensions, this is if you uh, want to install all kinds of extensions. These are VS Code extensions, but basically they help you do all kinds of things. So for example, if you want to run Python code, then you would install this extension. There's one for R, uh, there's, there's different kinds of 
extensions that you can use, Docker, etc. Okay, so we're going to go back to the Explorer because this is what we're going to use today, the Explorer here uh, feature. Uh, so this here, where it says Git training, so it's preloaded to the README file, as you can see, or if I switch tabs here, I can look at the Git ignore. So this panel here, this is called the editor, and this is where you edit files, basically. So for example, uh, let's say that for some reason, I don't want Git ignore to ignore the session data files. So I can just delete that, for example, or I can undo what I did. Um, so this is the editor. This is where you're going to edit your, doc your documentation, change your code, write code, etc. Okay. And then this panel here, which at the moment it has terminal selected. You can see there are other tabs here, right? There's problems, there's outputs, there's debug, console, ports, etc. So this panel here, this is basically, this is where you can see any kind of, for example, if you run your code, this is where you're going to see the output. Uh, the terminal, this is where we're going to input our Git commands. So there's all kinds of panels. We're not going to use all of them today. We're just going to use the terminal. But this is where you usually see your outputs and any kind of uh, debug information. And this is where you input your um, Git commands. And last but not least, there's the status bar here all the way down to the bottom. So this toolbar here, which says uh, code spaces, and there's this main here, and there's all kinds of strange looking icons and then all the way to the right there's some other extra options here and stuff so this is called the status bar and this provides uh this provides you with useful information about your code space and your project for example and it will have it will display the current the, the the current branch you're using at the moment so at the moment we're just in main we're using the main branch and this is actually quite useful because it's another way of confirming the branch you're currently working in. Um, cool. So we talked about the interface. Uh, again, if you have any questions, the link I put in the chat uh, goes through each kind of panel separately in, in case you're wondering what it does. And we are going to start going through the um, practical, which is the guide to Git link. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm also going to put the link in the chat. So I'm going to be following this guide um, for the practical. So if you open the link, the first section uh, you will see is the overview. And then there's a couple of subsections. So one is called what is version control. And there's another one, what is Git? What is, should I care? So basically this is going through the uh, slides that we previously talked about. And so there's a bit of theory here at the start. There's also um, a Git terminology link. There's some common basic commands. You don't, I mean, you can feel free to skim through these, but we're basically going to go through the Git commands that we're going to uh, use today. So we don't have to. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, let me just, yeah, I'm just going to bring it over here. Um, whoops, sorry, I just lost my momentum for a second. Yeah. Sorry. So if you click on the link that I put, the last link that I put in the chat, it will open this guide. And if you scroll through it, uh, the first sections is um, an overview and then a few subsections on what is version control, what is Git, why Git is important, what are the benefits, common basic Git commands, all these uh, basically um, the first few sections is what we basically talked about in the slides and then common basic commands. Um, some of these we're going to use today, others uh, really depends on the uh, scenario. But um, yeah, let me just have a look at the chat. I think there might be a few messages. Uh, 
rather your what are the benefits reasons for using code spaces rather than your own computer for VS Code, R Studio, etc. It's just uh, to simplify uh, matters for the workshop, really, um, because not using if we were to use um, our laptops or our computers, we would have to add another requirement to the workshop, and that would be for everyone to install Git. And that sometimes can be a bit um, complicated. Sometimes it might not go well for everyone. And so it just acts, it just adds an extra layer of complexity to the workshop. And since Code Spaces is, is a very simple virtual machine to just boot and, and use for the purpose of the of, of what we're trying to achieve with the workshop, then we just opted for, for code spaces. But you are more than welcome to use your own uh, computer and your own laptop um, if you wish to do so. Um, um, it's also because, um, I mean, a lot of workplaces now, they kind of opted for using virtual machines instead of using their own computers as well when they're uh, working on various Git projects as well. And sometimes that comes with Git pre-install, like code spaces, for example. Um, but yeah. So if I scroll a bit further down, there's the Git started setup for Git basics exercise. And so we are using GitHub as our Git repository hosting platform. And we have created a GitHub account, so we're going to skip that step. And um, so I'm just checking the chat to see if there's any messages. Cool. Right, so we're going to carry out steps one to five. So accessing a Git repository via, via code spaces, creating a branch, adding a new file, uploading your changes to GitHub via GitHub code spaces. So this is a language agnostic exercise. It covers the basics of accessing a Git repository, creating a new branch, making changes to your branch, and then finally committing and pushing these changes back to the repository on GitHub. Uh, depending on your starting point, this initial step, the, the, the first steps might differ. So for example, you might have to download Git if you're using a local machine, it's just to kind of address the question in the chat as well. However, steps one to five cover the core applicability of Git, which is will be the same uh, despite of your starting point. So for example, if you're using um, RStudio desktop, if you're using RStudio cloud, or if you're using Git locally, we have different links here for each uh, kind of instance. Um, but it doesn't, the, yeah, so despite the starting point, so if you're using RStudio desktop or if you're using something else, steps one to five will be, uh, there should be, exactly the same at their core, basically. It's the same, it's exactly the same process. You make changes to a folder, and then you use git commands to save those changes, and then push, to, push those changes back to GitHub. It's the same, it's the same workflow, if that makes sense. Cool, so I'm just gonna move this guide to the uh, other monitors so you guys can look at what I'm doing in code spaces. Um, so I'm back to code spaces here and I have, um, yes, I've created my code spaces session and the first step in the exercise says type git status in the terminal and you should see a message and we have attached the screenshot to the guide. So if I type git status, which is the first git command of the day. So I'm, I'm typing it in this terminal here, in this panel here. And I'm just typing git and then a white space status, and then I hit enter. So it has printed out a message which looks almost exactly like the message in the screenshot. The only thing that's different is the name of the repository. It's Git Training Fork test on the screenshot. For me, it's Git Training Fork. Um, so basically, Git status. Um, yeah, let's take, a, let's take a second here to talk about Git status. So is a, Git status is a very good beginner-friendly command. And I highly recommend you spam this command as much as possible 
when learning how to use get commands, as it basically tells you everything that is happening currently in your Git project. In fact, it will even tell you whether you are in a Git project or not. So basically, by typing Git status, you get three pieces of information. First of all, it will tell you on the first line here, it says on branch main. So it will confirm that you are you, like the, the branch name you're currently using. And at the moment, this is correct because when we copied, when we forked the repository, when we copied the repository, we only copied the main branch, the default branch of the repository. So there's only one branch in our copy. And indeed we are on branch main, so that's correct. So git status has confirmed that for us. The second piece of information is, it says here on the last line, there is nothing to commit. And again, that's another git term. And it basically it means that we haven't made any changes yet. So we haven't changed anything to our files or to we haven't deleted a folder. We haven't done anything yet to this repository. And it's absolutely true, indeed. Um, we, we haven't done anything yet to the repository. And then the third piece of information is that the command worked. So that means that we are indeed in, in a Git project. Um, this is very important because when you use Git locally, uh, it's very it's it can be tricky to when you're using a terminal on your computer to point the correct um, to, to point the terminal towards the Git project, the Git folder that you're trying to use. So the first command that you should use to, in order to check whether the terminal is correctly looking at the correct Git project folder is to use is to type git status. If it's not a Git project, if for some reason the terminal is pointing towards your pictures folder or your downloads folder, it will tell you this is not a Git project. What the hell are you doing? Um, so basically, yeah. So when Git status actually works, it's a great sign that indeed the terminal is looking at the um, correct Git project as well, because it will tell you the title of the repository. So we've successfully completed uh, step number one. So we're gonna move to step number two, which is to create and switch to a new branch. So if you remember in that image, in that workflow image we looked previously at in uh, one of the slides, we have the main branch, which was that green color, in the image and then we were pretending to work on a document and if we wanted to create uh, if uh, other people wish to contribute to the document then they would have to create copies of the main branch right they would have to create their own branches and um, this is exactly what we're going to do because we are going to pretend that the main branch has a lot of important uh, information. There are a lot of important files on main and we don't want to accidentally delete something. So we're going to create our own version of the main branch. We're going to create our own branch just like we did in that image. And that's the point of step two. Again, if you look at step two, there's a bit of, uh, there's a bit of text explaining, just recapping uh, what the word branch means and the kind of, um, the whole kind of reasoning behind creating uh, new branches. Um, and if I go a bit further down in the exercise, um, right, yes. Yeah, so if we want to make any kind of uh, edits, if we want to add new code, so basically eventually, once we reach to a point in our new branch, when we want to move the, um, the work that we've carried out to the back to the main branch, then we're going to submit a pull request. Now that's something we're going to look in the afternoon session, and Joe is going to show us how to do that. Um, but we'll just we'll just keep that in the back of our, our minds at the moment. But for now, we're just going to focus on creating a new branch and how to do that. So step number two: create a new branch. So how are we going to do this? We're going to go back to GitHub. So we're going to go back to, um, uh, sorry, just a second. I'm going to go back to the uh, forked version of my repository. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to do this. Go on a second. Just, I have 
So I have too many tabs open at the moment. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, I think I've accidentally closed my code spaces, um, but it's fine. I can go back to it. Um, anyway, so how are we going to create a new branch? So we're back to our repository. And I'm going to click here where it says main. And I'm going to click on this drop down menu. And I'm going to start typing the name of my new branch. So what I'm going to type is I'm going to put my initials. Uh, okay, keyboard is working. So I'm going to put HR. And I'm going to put an underscore. And I'm just going to call this test branch. Now you might ask, you might ask me, why did you put your initials? Because there are various conventions, like naming conventions when, when it comes to naming, like when it comes to best practice and naming your branches. But basically the whole idea is that when you work in a team setting, and so you're expecting to have like lots of contributors to specific uh, Git project, for example, like lots of de developers working on the same repository. The idea is to have to add your initials at the start of the name of your, bran your branch. So when others look at that branch, they immediately instantly know that, oh, okay, this is Helen's branch. Oh, JW. Oh, this is Joe's brand. You know, so basically that's the whole kind of idea behind that. There are other things, of course, where you can add to the branch name. So you can add like ticket numbers and all kinds of things, but we're going to keep, keep things simple. And we're just going to add our initials. So HR underscore test underscore branch. And then I'm going to create branch from main. And this means that it's going to create a copy of the main branch. Okay. So now we've created a copy. It has a little nice banner message here for us. It says branch created. And I'm going to, um, also if you notice here, the, the word branches, it has added a second branch because previously it said one branch. Now it says two branches, okay? So now I'm just gonna go back to uh, my code spaces session. Hang on a second. Uh, is it? I don't know. Let me just refresh. Ah, there we go. Okay, so if for some reason it kicks you out of code spaces and you can't go back in, all you have to do is go here to the um to this button here, to the left hand side, and then click on code spaces. And if you click on it, it would bring you to the screen which has a list of all your active code spaces, and then it has the code space that I previously uh, started here. So this is how you can go back to your uh, uh, virtual machine if for some reason it kicks you out. Okay, so it's taking me back. Okay, and it's kept, it remembers the uh, last command that we previously put in the um, in the terminal. I'm just going to type git status again, just to confirm that it's still working and it's still reacting to me. Okay, cool. Great. Right. So we've created a new branch on GitHub, but we are in our virtual machine at the moment. And if I scroll a bit further down in the exercise, um, after the screenshots, it says, um, head back to the terminal. So that bullet point where it says back to the terminal, it says type git branch dash A to view a list of all available branches existing in the repository. The branches that contain the uh, prefix remote path are the branches online on GitHub. So if I type the command, it asks me to type. So git branch dash A and I click enter. So it's going to show it's just, it's displaying a list of the current branches that are re it's reading from the repository. And as we can see, it has an asterisk and it has the word main. And we know there's a main branch that's part of the repository, right? And the asterisk basically displays that we're currently on this branch. But if we look at this list, um, we don't really see the branch we just created, right? Because I created a branch which 
it was called HR underscore test branch, something like that, right? So it's not in this list of branches. And the reason for that is because if you're using, if you're working on a virtual machine, if you're working locally on your computer, on your laptop, uh, as we previously mentioned, you're basically working on a copy of the repository. You're not actually, um, you're not directly working on the GitHub repository. So any kind of changes that take place online on GitHub, those will not instantly update with your copy because they're not automatically synchronized. You use Git commands to do that. And the whole idea behind that is because the whole the whole purpose for that is because it's it's basically a safeguard in case uh, for some reason somebody accidentally breaks something, etc. The whole idea is to work on your copy of the repository, carry out your work, and then once you're happy with any changes you've made, then you update your changes back to GitHub or GitLab or whatever it is you're using, uh, and you follow a review process where you make sure that the changes you've made are um, according to the criteria of you know the changes that you're basically aiming to make, depending on the ticket you were working on, for example, or depending uh, if this is a solo project, what you were trying to achieve, etc. Um, so the next question you might ask me is, okay, how do we make if someone makes any changes to the main branch on GitHub, how can I make these changes uh, appear on my copy? Uh, so I can have, so I can uh, make sure that I'm working on the latest version uh, of the repository that's on GitHub. Well, this is where another command comes in, and that one is called git pull, and it basically stands for pull all the latest updates from the repository. So if I click enter in the uh, terminal, if you read the message that is printed out right after you input the command, it says, there's a little asterisk. It says there's a new branch, so HR test branch, and already up to date. So it's basically letting you know that all the contents of the repository of your copy of the repository are up to date, and that it found a new branch. And that's correct, because we did add a new branch. And if we type the previous command again, which is git branch under, uh, dash a, you'll now notice that there's a new branch in the list, which is HR test branch, okay? Again, the remote prefix, that means that these branches, um, these branches exist online, but currently locally, what we're using is the main branch. So you might ask now, how do we um, switch branches? Because we don't want to work on the main branch, we want to work on the branch that we just created. Um, so in order to do that, all you have to do is type the next command, which is git checkout. So we're checking out a new branch. And we're going to type our branch name. Uh, HR, I forgot my branch name, test branch. Uh, is that what it's called? Yeah, that's what it's called. Cool. So git underscore, uh, sorry, git space, checkout space, and then branch name. And if you look at the message that's printed out, it says switch to a new branch called HR test branch. So it's letting you know that it's done this successfully, but we can also type git status if we're paranoid. And it will confirm to us that indeed we are on branch, HR test branch. And again, it's telling you that there's nothing to commit, which is obvious because we haven't we haven't made any changes. Right? We haven't we haven't deleted any files. We haven't added any files. We haven't changed anything yet. Uh, and another another thing, which is to do with the interface that we previously talked about, HR test branch, we it is another way of confirming that indeed we are on the correct branch here on the bottom toolbar of the uh, interface. Cool. So we have completed, successfully completed step number two. Um, if anyone is stuck for some reason at this point, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, it can be tricky when inputting Git commands for the first time. So if anyone is confused, feel free to uh, 
let us know. Very happy to help. Um, so just to kind of recap what I've done, if I scroll a bit further up in my terminal, well, we booted the uh, virtual machine, right? So we started a code spaces session. We talked a little bit about the interface. Um, we put we inputted our first git command, which was git status, which is a very nice um, beginner friendly command because it lets you know that indeed you're working in a git project. It confirms the branch you're currently working in. And it also lets you know if there've been any changes to the current status of the branch. So for example, if you added any files, if you deleted any files, if you've written any you know, new documentation or code or whatever, all of that will be displayed in this message. Um, then because we have a very important task to do, we have lots of important work to, uh, to do, we decided that we want to create a new branch. So we created a copy of the main branch and we created that on the GitHub repository. And then we went back to our virtual machine. Um, or if you're using your, your local machine, your laptop, or if you're using our studio cloud, if you're using any kind of basically um, anything <laughs> that you're using basically to uh, use Git commands and access GitHub, uh, you will then input Git pull to pull the latest information from the repository on GitHub. So you have the most up-to-date information on your copy of the repository. And we also then switched to the branch because we want to carry out our work on our own branch. We don't want to affect the main branch. And also, I mean, imagine if there are other branches as well in the repository. So for example, if Joe has another branch, uh, if somebody else has another branch in the repository, this is, um, this is a very nice way to confirm by typing git status after switching to your own branch, just to make sure that you're not using someone else's branch and you're using your own branch. Cool. So now we're on step three of the exercise, which is add a new file and make a few changes. So this is the fun, this is where the fun part begins. So this is where we're going to start destroying everything to do with the, uh, with our branch. We can delete everything if we want to. Um, feel free to do whatever you'd like to do. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, click here on this drop down. So I'm just going to collapse this folder here, which is called practice scripts. And if you look at this folder, it has a bunch of files. So it has the basic SQL query file. It has a file which is conveniently called delete this file. I wonder what, what's the purpose of that. Uh, there's a Python file here which is called example Python convert Fahrenheit. So it's a function that's converting uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius degrees, I assume. Uh, there's an R script here, example R script. So there's a bunch of uh, files in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on practice scripts folder and we get a bunch of new options. I'm gonna click new file And I'm going to name this file uh, cats underscore and dogs. And this is going to be a Python file. And how do I know this is a Python file? Because I'm going to add the .py file format. So if you're not familiar with Python scripts, this is how Python scripts look like. They have the .py file format. Similarly for SQL files, they have the .sql and for R they have .r. So I'm just gonna uh, click somewhere else and then it's automatically registered that this is a new file. And if I click, so I'm just gonna remove some of these tabs just to make some space. So currently I'm in the cats and dogs Python script and if you're not familiar with Python, I'm basically, what I'm going to type right now, this is the most kind of beginner friendly first Python command. If you ever, if you ever go to like a beginner's course to Python, this will most likely be the first command you'll ever uh, practice using in Python, in a, in a Python console or Python terminal, which is print a message. So I'm gonna print, um, 
sorry, my keyboard is not very responsive. Oh, there we go. Hello to everyone in this call. Exclamation point. OK, so just to recap, what I did is I right clicked on the practice scripts folder and then I clicked on new file and it automatically created a new file where it asked me to add a title and I called it cats and dogs, cats underscore and underscore dogs. And I put dot pi just to kind of let Git and GitHub know that this is going to be a Python file. And I've opened the file and I've typed in a command which is called print. Hello everyone to everyone in this call. Feel free to, to create any kind of file you want to create. Feel free to type anything you want to create. Uh, type. I can type other things here as well, like hello, hello, hello. Like it literally doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. And that is step three completed. So we've just created a new file. And then step four is the juicy part of the exercise. And this is where we're going to input a bunch of Git commands because we are at a point where we are happy with our work and we want to save our work and we want to store our work back to GitHub on our branch on GitHub. Because at the moment, <clears throat> on in our virtual machine or on your local computer, we have created a new file called cats and dogs. If you go back to the repository on GitHub, uh, so if I go back to, is it this one? Yes, if I click the refresh button. So currently, if I, if I click on the drop down menu, right, there's two branches here. So there's main, which has the default tag. So GitHub is very, is being very nice and helpful to us, letting us know that this is the main branch of the repository. But currently looking at the tick uh, symbol, we are currently on the HR underscore test underscore branch, which is the branch that we're currently using for our work. Uh, so we are currently on our branch. And if I go to the practice scripts folder, as you can see, well, we can't see the cats and dogs script. So we've created that script in our virtual machine or on our local computer. But as you can see, it's not on GitHub because as we previously mentioned, they're not synchronized. We are working on an offline version of our copy of the repository. If we want to make any changes appear on GitHub, we have to use Git commands to let GitHub know that we have made changes on our local copy, on our copy of the repository and we want to update these changes back to GitHub. So I'm going to go back to, uh, if I can find my, my virtual machine, I just, this is, oh, there we go, cats and dogs, cool. Right, so step four, commit your changes, follow standard Git command workflow. So let's make, cats and dogs Python script appear on GitHub. That's the gist of this exercise. So in the terminal, type the following, and I suggest to read through the Git messages displayed after each command entered in the terminal to familiarize yourself with the logic. So it says for the first step of the exercise, it says to type git status. OK, so we've typed git status and we're going to read the message. So git status is once again confirming that indeed we are on the correct branch. So this is my test branch I've created because I don't want to work on the main branch. But in this case, it's giving us a nice little message that's saying we have untracked files. And it says here, practice scripts folder, cats and dogs, Python script. So it basically, it's telling us that, hey, you've created a new file in this folder, and it's called cats and dogs. So as we previously as we previously mentioned, git status will let you know about any kind of changes that occur to your branch. 
And indeed, we have created a new branch, uh, sorry, a new file, which is called cats and dogs. And the next step of the exercise, it says type git add file name to stage your changes or git add full stop to simply stage all changes automatically use with caution. So the um, this so git add and then stage your changes. So these are a few new fancy words that we haven't come across before. Um, and this is entirely new git command that we um, that we're about to use. So before we use git add, I just want to say a couple of things about the word staging and the phrase staging your changes. So basically staging stage, this is a git term. And this is this is a term, this is this terminology is uh, for temporarily saving any changes you've made to your Git project, uh, and these changes are saved locally. So staging is basically saving any changes you've made, but these changes will not be saved automatically on GitHub. They will not be reflected on the online version of this repository. They will only be stored for your copy. Okay. So you can only see them on the copy of the repository you're currently working on. Because as we previously mentioned, local version and online version do not synchronize automatically. And we need to use git commands to update the online version with whatever we are doing in our local version of the uh, repository. And it says if I want to temporarily save my changes, so basically stage your changes, which is the git fancy phrase for that. It says use git add. So I'm just gonna add, uh, I'm just gonna type git add, and then I'm going to type the file name, which is cats and dogs. Dot pi. Um, oh, I might need to do the, hang on a second. I might need to add the entire with the folder path as well. So it's giving me a bunch of notifications. Let's try it that again. Scripts, cats and dogs. There, there we go. Okay, it just needed the folder name as well at the start. So basically, the command is git space add space and then practice scripts, which is the folder which the new file is currently in, and then cats and dogs.py. And we've inputted this command. Nothing has happened seemingly, but if I type git status, like the instructions tell me to do so, it says that type git status, now you will see the file modifications have a nice green color. This means that git add was successful. Indeed, looking at the terminal, we can see that the red color has been replaced by a nice green color. And it's also confirming that we're still working on our current branch. So that's nice to see. Again, if anyone is stuck at any point, uh, please feel free to uh, shout or <laughs> type something in the chat. These steps can be a bit tricky. Um, cool. So we've done git add. We've temporarily saved our changes locally. Uh, if you go back to GitHub on the repository, again, cats and dogs will not be there. I'm just going to stop these notifications. Um, OK. Uh, so anything we've saved at the moment is just on our local copy. Uh, so in this case, in the virtual machine, or if you're using your local computer, or if you're using some other kind of interface. Uh, now it says step four, type git commit dash M, and then a commit message to commit these changes. So again, new fancy words relating to git. And basically what this step means is that we are committing our changes because previously the changes we made, we just saved them temporarily. However, 
just imagine a situation, like a scenario where you're working on your local branch, your current branch, and you are making your changes, but it's lunch break, you've changed your mind, uh, you want you don't want to continue working, so you're going to pick this up later. And then you come back later and you realize that cats and dogs, the file that you created, you don't want to create, you want to delete this file and when you want to create a different file. And then you would do the same thing. You do git status, you do git add again, etc. Um, once you reach the point where you have decided that I am very happy with these changes and I want these changes to be pushed back to GitHub to the online version of the project, then you're going to use the git commit uh, command. So basically, it's the final command to use in terms of I am very certain that these changes are final and I want these changes to appear on GitHub and I'm going to commit them now by using the git commit, commit command. So I'm going to type git commit dash m just like in the instructions and it has a little um, prompt there. It says your commit message here. So it's asking me to add a little message. This little message here, basically the, the purpose of this message is that you want to add a summary of your changes because when you look at the history of the repository later on, um, if you have multiple people working on the same repository, so for example, if Joe has created a new branch and he's made some changes and he's committed these changes and he's pushed these changes back to GitHub. Um, if I look at the history of the repository, it will present a list of all the commit messages. And then Joe will have written a nice commit message that says, I made these changes to my branch. And then I'll look at this message and I'll, I'll think, oh, Joe has made these changes to his branch. That's really cool, amazing. Well done, Joe. So. We're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to type a message that summarize, summarizes our, um, our changes. So I'm just going to type, um, I've uh, just going to type created a Python, I can't type, Python script about cats and dogs. Full stop. And then I'm going to uh, close the, uh, Double quotes. Okay, so this is the command git commit dash m and then space and then created a Python script about cats and dogs. You may have uh, made like different changes. So maybe you created a different script or maybe you deleted some files. Uh, it's, it's entirely up to you what kind of message you want to input here at this point. So I'm just going to hit enter because this is, I'm very happy with the message I've just written. Okay, and now it's written. Um, it's presented us with another message. It says, uh, HR test branch, it's given me a commit code. This is commit hash code here. And it's also reprinted the message that we just put in the commit. So it says created a Python script about cats and dogs. And it says one file has changed for insertions, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. Now, step five says type git status again. And interestingly, if you type git status, it says we are still, it's still confirming that we are on the correct branch. And it's no longer presenting us the changes that we've done to the file. Instead, it has a different message and it says, your branch is ahead of origin test branch by one commit. Use git push to publish your local commits. So at this point, if you don't remember what to do, git is very uh, helpful and it's telling us what's the next command to use. Um, but basically what this message means is that the version of the branch that we're currently using locally is ahead of the version of our branch that's on GitHub. Because if we go back to GitHub now, if I find the, uh, do, 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 there we go. If I find the uh, forked version of my repository on GitHub, if I hit the refresh button, And at the moment, as you can see, it's put me on main, but I'm going to click so I can go back to my branch. And if I go back to the practice scripts folder, because this is where I've created the cats and dogs script, it's not here. You can't see the script, the uh, cats and dogs Python script, because we still haven't used the final command, which is git push, which what this command, what's what? Sorry, what this command does is it will upload all your committed changes back to GitHub.
So if I go back to my virtual machine and I type git push, this might take a few seconds depending on what you're using. Um, sometimes when I'm using my laptop and I'm pushing changes back to GitHub, it can take up to half a minute sometimes. It really depends on um, whatever it is it's doing. Um, but as we can see, there's a bunch of messages, there's a bunch of information here. We can't really, um, we can skip this, but basically the uh, important thing to look at is the last kind of part where it says that it has pushed changes back to our branch online. So if I go back to the repository on GitHub, and if I hit the refresh button, and I confirm that I'm looking at my branch here on the drop-down menu, uh, there's also a little banner here that's uh, basically a spoiler, but it's basically letting, letting us know that, hey, there's been a new change on this branch. Um, but if I also click the practice scripts folder here, there we go, we have cats and dogs, Python script. And also if we look here all the way to the right, it says last commit date was three minutes ago. And if we look at the last commit message, it has a little message that we created, created a Python script about cats and dogs. Uh, obviously for you it might be different, um, but if I click on the cats and dogs script, it has the print message that we uh, previously written. So hello to everyone in this call. And also we just we just spammed hello on line number four. Okay, so that was the conclusion of the exercise. I'm going to do this once more, just to show you how repetitive this workflow is when it comes to developing code or or writing some kind of documentation and then you using git, git to track your changes and then pushing your changes back to github so i'm going to go back to code spaces and let's say i've decided that i don't want cats and dogs python script anymore i don't need it so i'm just going to right click on it i'm going to delete it delete permanently I'm going to delete it. I'm also going to delete this file here that says delete this file because I don't want it. So I'm just going to delete it. I'm deleting everything at this point. And I'm also going to delete the R script because why not? Deleting everything. Now, if I go back to GitHub and if I hit the refresh button, so we've just deleted three files in the practice folders in the practice script folder, sorry. If I hit, if I click on the practice scripts folder here, those files are still there. So if for some reason everything you decide that, well, not you decide, but accidentally delete everything on your folder, those files will still be there. Okay, so no harm done. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the uh, code spaces and I'm going to, I've deleted the files, but I've also, I'm also going to add a new extra code. So I'm just going to add another line here about, uh, I'm just going to add another filter to this SQL code. And uh, I don't know, uh, city equals London, something very generic. Okay. And then I'm going to go back to the terminal. I'm going to type git status. And again, confirming that indeed we are working on the correct branch. And now we have a lot of like lots of changes, a list of uh, lots of changes here. So we have, it says we've deleted three files. We've deleted cats and dogs. We've deleted a file called delete this file and we've deleted the R script. And we've modified the SQL file. We've added another line here that says and city equals London. Okay, so I'm just going to follow the workflow that we previously followed that I'm just going to type um, git add. But instead of typing git add and then the specific file name, because we have lots of changes, I'm going to type git add space and then full stop. And the full stop, basically what it means is I'm adding all the changes to the stage. To, I'm staging all of the changes to the index. That's the fancy git terminology. What it basically means is I'm temporarily saving all my changes locally. 
So I'm typing git add space full stop. Use this command with caution because it will automatically um, save all your changes, but there might be some changes that you don't want to save. Just carefully go through this list because there might be a file you have accidentally deleted. Um, so use that command with caution. Uh, okay, so we've just done git add. I'm gonna do git status again. Red color changes to green color. Then the next step is to do git commit dash m message deleted three files and added new code line in SQL file. End of double quotes, hit the enter button. Okay, and it has printed out a message saying that yes, we've done, we've successfully committed these changes. And if I do another git status, the green color should have disappeared by now. It has disappeared indeed. And if I don't remember what's the next git command, it's telling me kindly to use git push to update my changes back to GitHub. Input in git push might take a few seconds, depending on internet connection and other mysterious reasons. If I go back to the, uh, doo -doo -doo, if I go back to the repository, Again, checking to see if I'm the correct branch here. Go back to the practice scripts folder. And yeah, it looks kind of empty here because we have deleted a bunch of files. And last commit date now, last commit message, deleted three files and added a new code line in SQL file. Go back to SQL file. Indeed, we can see the new line we just added, which is city equals London. Cool. That's basically um, how Git works. This is how you apply version control to your project. You have a folder with a bunch of files or a folder that contains other folders and you make changes to those files. You delete files, you add new files, you change the contents, you add code, you delete code. And then you use Git to track all these changes. You use Git status as we previously saw here in the terminal. It doesn't matter how many changes we make, Git will track all of them, all the file deletions, all the file modifications. And then once you're happy, you temporarily store all these changes using git add. And then you use git status again to confirm that each command has successfully, uh, was successfully inputted. And then once you're happy with everything that you've done for the day, then you can just use git commit, a nice little message summarizing the changes you've made. Like for example, here we deleted three files and we added a new code, code line in SQL file. And then git status again to confirm that that was also uh, a successful git command. And uh, finally, you do the uh, last command, which is git push and you push all your changes back to GitHub. And that's how it works. That's how GitHub and well, this is how git works initially two-step process, as we said at the start of the workshop, use Git to track your changes, then you use Git commands to push all these changes back to GitHub, and GitHub is the place where you store your Git projects online. Okay, um, let's have a look at the chat. If you make changes to multiple files at once, should we commit them separately so that files on GitHub only have relevant messages besides them? That's a very good question. Uh, it really depends on the context. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, because most of the times the changes you make, they'll all be part of a bigger kind of change. So for example, I might have a folder that contains a lot of scripts that have to do with developing an Android app, for example. And every piece of script, every piece of file will do, will do its own kind of separate little functionality, will have its own significant purpose. Um, you don't have to do multiple commits to have a different message for each file. Uh, what matters is to have a nice little message, a commit message basically that summarizes the change, uh, which serves the purpose of the functionality that you are building at the moment. So for example, you might be working on an Android app and you might be developing the messaging function 
of the specific app. And everything you did for that day, everything had to do with just adding the new feature that was the messaging function. Um, so at the end of the day, you could do one large commit, basically, that is, and the title of the, well, the message of the commit would be added functionality for messaging on Android app. Later on, of course, when you eventually want to push, merge your work from your branch back to the main branch of the repository, that's where a review process will take place. And that's what we're going to look in the afternoon session with Joe, where you basically submit a pull request, will, which will initiate a review process. And that will usually contain a detailed change log of what exactly you've done. So we'll have a list of all the files you've changed and all the like various bits of pieces of information that you want to basically attach to the uh, review process that will help the reviewer and whoever's, whoever else is having a look at your code. For example, if you're developing code for that Android app, let's say in this example, then everything will be listed there, if that makes sense. The whole idea about git commit, and I think Joe will also uh, talk about this later on in the afternoon session, is that ideally in terms of best practice, it's recommended to not spam uh, the Git repository history with multiple commit messages. The commit messages should be meaningful. There should be a meaningful summarization of what you are currently working on. You don't need to have every little detail of every little file you've changed, basically, if that makes sense. But we'll talk about this again in the afternoon session. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, again, this is also something that comes with experience and in terms of like context because context matters like it really depends for example if you're working on a solo project you might not care and you might just want to have multiple commit messages because it might be helpful for you uh, or you might be working in a team uh, in a work kind of environment where your senior the senior engineer of the, the senior developer of the team has requested that you don't uh, do multiple commits and you just do meaningful commits so you don't spam the repository history with like lots of commit messages. Really depends on the context as well. Um, so yeah, cool. Uh, I think I'm just quickly checking the chat to see if there's anything else. Um, yeah, if unless there's anything, I mean, feel free to ask any other questions during the lunch break. Uh, we'll pick them up once we come back. But um, that's basically the end of the uh, morning session of the uh, introduction to version control Git and GitHub workshop. Uh, so we'll take an hour now. Um, we'll, we'll come back at 10 past one where Joe will talk about the uh, scarier parts of uh, Git. No, I'm joking, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if, Joe, you want to give us a spoiler, maybe, or any kind of... Yeah, sure. So we'll, we'll be covering um, basically how you can um, start using the features of Git that allow you to collaborate. Um, so um, we'll be uh, yeah, going a bit more into branches and how you can um, create branches, change branches, merge branches together, um, uh, either for, like, if you want to update your branch or you want to pull, put a pull request together to merge into your main branch and how you deal with when two, mar two, um, two branches disagree on the changes and there's a conflict, how do you resolve that? Um, and it's uh, much easier when it's uh, than person-to-person uh, -person conflicts. Uh, to resolve. Uh, so yeah, that's what's going on for the afternoon. And what time uh, shall we come back? Um, shall we say quarter past 12 or? Yeah, yeah, say, say quarter past 12, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, quarter past one. <laughs> quarter past one. <laughs> quarter past 12 is in two minutes. <laughs> yeah. That's Quit a very fast lunch break. break. <laughs> there you have it, have an hour. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see you then. Yeah, see you guys. Bye. There we go, the robot told me we're going in progress. Right, so welcome back everyone um, to the afternoon session of um, the introduction to Git um, workshop or introduction to version control. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can see the presentation. 
Um, I want screen one. There we go. Okay, so you should be able to see that now. I'm just going to quickly sort out my screens. There we go. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Fabulous. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, Helen's going to be monitoring the chat. So if you've got any questions, do feel free to put, pop it in. Um, although I do have the chat window open, so um, I might be able to address it as well in flow. Um, so yeah. Um, so this afternoon we're going to be talking about how you can collaborate with um, Git, um, which is a really, really um, useful uh, aspect of Git is is the the tools that it provides to sort of allow you to collaborate with each other. Um, so the objectives of the this afternoon session, uh, we're going to go over sort of why you should be collaborating with Git. Uh, and using Git to collaborate. Um, we're going to be, uh, and then we're going to get into some activities working with branches, which is the key tool that allows you to do this. Um, so we talked about a bit about branches this morning, um, but we're just going to um, reinforce that stuff again. Uh, we're going to go over like how you can name branches, uh, just how you can just work with them, um, uh, then creating, changing, and merging branches together. And also just go over some general guidelines and then we're going to finish off the day by just um, exploring GitHub and the open source community and sort of giving you some links uh, to follow uh, for that. So uh, why should you uh, collaborate using Git? Um, as you might know, um, collaborating with others on a project can sometimes get a bit messy. Uh, wires can get a bit crossed. Um, they can miscommunication or... Um, and, and yeah, so... Uh, and if you're working on something uh, with other people, uh, let's say like a Word document or a, a um, piece of code or a, a pipeline or analysis, something like that, um, your changes can sort of easily get tangled together and hard work can be, might be overwritten or accidentally lost. Um, so this is really, really important consideration. Um, Git is great because it allows you to create branches sort of, and separate the, those out of those changes. Um, branches you can think of like different versions of the codes, um, sort of parallel versions that sort of split off. Um, any new changes um, you will make uh, in your sort of like development process or sort of you know working process will first be made to your branches um, and you'll have this central main branch usually called main um, but also can be called um, master if you're on an old repository um, or dev or develop or live depending on how you're working but usually it's called main we keep that nice and clean and stable so we don't want any, any messy changes to go into there any work in progress is kept out of the main branch um, once the changes have been um, uh, made and reviewed and approved by your team members or yourself, they can be, um, but usually you really want your team members because you want a different set of eyes on it, they can be merged safely into the main repository. This model of um, using branches with a shared repository is called the shared repository mo model. So a number of different models that um, version control systems use, but get used to the shared uh, repository model. Um, so there's different way, ways to collaborate and write codes um, with your remote repository hosting platform. So this morning I went through the differences between like Git and GitHub. Um, so GitHub is the like the online platform um, that you use to uh, host your codes. Um, and then you will have Git installed on your computer, um, which talks to GitHub and, and sort of is, is Git is the tool, GitHub is the platform. You also have like different platforms such as GitLab and Bitbucket. Um, uh, GitLab, I believe, is an open source um, thing, um, and Bitbucket is um, uh, I can't remember who it's owned by, um, but these are different sort of um, hosting platforms, but they usually work in very, very similar ways. And what you can learn on GitHub might actually quite easily translate across to GitLab. Um, and there's usually some good guides out there to help you translate between them. Um, 
you also got uh, this idea of integrated development environment. So this is where you're actually writing your code and making your changes um, before you push them up to sort of your uh, remote repository hosting platform. Um, and you have different ones. So today we're working with GitHub Code Spaces, which is sort of a online version of VS Code in a, in a virtual machine. Um, you can also have uh, like R Studio or uh, I believe it's called like Posit now and Posit Clouds. Um, uh, you, so you can work in there or you can have Visual Studio Code on your desktop installed um, or you could use like PyCharm. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can write code and collaborate with each other. So um, branches. Um, so when you're working with a team, it can be very, very useful to have a agreed understanding of like how you will name your branches and how you'll name things. It can really, really help um, you to, uh, to to look at look over the repository and look at your teammates' code and see what they're working on and 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 stuff like that and sort of who's working on it. So we typically advise um, this format. So we've got the branched type at the start. Uh, branch type uh, could mean your it, it is basically like a folder that you put it into. Um, and these are completely optional. Um, and you typically have three types that you would have. You would have feature, so you'd be that would be for adding new features. You have a release, so it, let's say you were um, releasing your codes, um, or yeah, you wanted to take a cut and preserve that cut um, for delivery. Um, you would use the release branch. Um, those those branches would typically not change uh, much, or they they'll change up into a point and then stay static as sort of like an archive. And then hotfix. Um, that's basically to signify this is a very very um, a quick change that you're making to your to your uh, main branch. You partic particularly have this um, this hotfix if you're protecting your main branch. So that's putting rules in place in the um, uh, in the repository, um, uh, so yeah, um, yeah. So, so protecting branches when you have rules in your repository that stops any changes um, being made to to a certain branch. For example, you have to like make a pull request to merge to it, something like that. So you would create a hotfix branch and make your changes, and then be able to merge that in and just signify, okay, this is for high priority. So uh, but let's have a look at creating a branch. So we've already had a look at this morning about how we can create a branch. Uh, so um, we can do this remotely via GitHub and pull onto our local robot stream. Um, and you can see here sort of the method that we can do. Um, and I've shown two ways you can do this on your, um, on your local repository. Um, you can use the command line at the bottom and that's usually the way I recommend when you're first learning, uh, get to, to 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 use the command line and and type these commands out. So we will type git checkout feature forward slash jw new branch, which is the new branch we made. VS Code and other IDEs also have like really nice UIs um, that will allow you to do that without typing these commands out. This is great once you're used to working with. Um, uh, working with Git and working with these online um, uh, platforms like uh, GitHub. And once you're used to using those, then you can you might want to just speed things up a bit and use the UI. So it totally depends what you're more comfortable with and what you want to use. The big caveat with UIs is when you want to do extremely powerful stuff, very, very specific stuff, it can sometimes be harder to do. Um, then by typing out the command in the command line, you can be very specific in the command line. We can also um, create a branch locally on our own, like where we're developing on our own machine, um, and then push it up to GitHub from a code space. So just going back a slide, here we, we created a branch online and then pulled it down. Um, and in this example, we are going to create a branch on our local machine, on, on the uh, local to our environment and push it up to GitHub. And again, 
we can do this with the UI in VS Code um, or in the terminal or shell, depending on what you want to call it. Um, so on the on the left here, we've got the commands here that you can use to uh, use the terminal. So we use git checkout, and we add a dash dash branch, and that means like create this branch, um, and then then we give the branch name, and then we will then have to push it up by saying git push. And again, we have to add this little, um, it's called a flag, um, dash dash set dash upstream um, origin feature, and then the name of the branch, so feature JW new branch. Um, so to take you through what these individual bits mean, so git push we've already encountered, so that means like push up to the remote repository. Set upstream says set um, your local branch to almost track, to link with, a newly created um, remote branch that gets created on the remote repository. So set upstream, so so push it up and set it there and link the two. Origin, uh, we just need to be specific about um, that we're setting on our remote repository origin. Um, it's very rare you would use a different command other than origin and then feature GW new branch. And we can see here how we can do in VS Code. Um, so we can click that the little button down at the bottom called main, which tells us which branch we want. We just click that, and it'll bring up this drop down at the top. And you can see at the bottom, you can you can see the different branches that are available already. We also has got the option to create a new branch there. And you've got two options there: uh, create a new branch, which is saying create it from the current branch you got checked out. So we create it from main, or let's say we're on, I'm on um, uh, feature JW change branches um, and I want to create a new branch from main, I can do create a new branch from. So let's try it out. Let's let's do this actually instead of me telling you. Um, so feel free to follow along um, and I'm going to code on screen. Um, so I'm going to bring up my browser and I'm going to close my search for this uh, restaurant. Okay. Um, so here we got the, the repository open up um, and I've got the NHS R community repository opened up. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fork this um, like I did this morning. So if you haven't done this yet and want to uh, follow along this afternoon, you can do this. Um, so I'm going to call this actually Git training forked. Um, I leave these all the same, copy main branch only. Great, create fork. It's going to take a second. Okay, I created the, the fork repository and it looks it's looking all happy. Okay, then I'm gonna go and set up my code space. And again, I'm gonna create code space on main. Now, some of you um, might have your code space still open from this morning and you might go back to it and it might have um, sort of stopped running. Uh, just click sort of restart. Um, or you can go into here and, uh, or saying opening code space, but it should have a list of currently open code spaces that you can just go in and resume. So it's all woken up and ready to run. It's brought up the readme, does this by default. I'm just gonna close this. So first of all, um, we're gonna go back to our repository and we could create a new branch from here. So we're going to call this feature, um, and I'm going to call it JW, put my initials, um, and I'm going to put new branch to pull. And let's go say here, create feature JW new branch to pull. So I click on that, and let's go create it. Let's go say branch created, and it shows up here. We go back to our um, our code space here, and I'm just going to run a git pull. Okay, and that's just to update. Uh, that will just update our local um, repository with information of what's happened on the remote. We could also do a git fetch, which is one of these commands, um, and that just fetches the latest information. Um, it says nothing because uh, nothing's changed since we last 
did something. So close this pop up. I'm just going to clear what we can uh, keep it there. Okay, so we're going to get checkouts and we're going to put in the name of the branch. JW, a uh, new branch to pull, which I think was the name. Let's just double check it. New branch to pull. Excellent. Press enter, and it's checked it out. Lovely. Okay, um, we're going to just go back to our main um, branch. So we're going to do git checkout main. Another, uh, just a nice quick uh, little tip that you can do. If you want to go back to your previous branch that you had check checked out, um, but don't want to type out the name because it might be a bit long, you can just do git checkout dash. And just go back to the previous one we were on, which is main. And we can run that command again and we switch back. So it's nice if you have to switch back between branches quickly, um, we can do that. Okay, we're gonna create a new branch that we're gonna push up now. So we're gonna do this in the command line. We're gonna go git checkout double dash branch. Uh, if you're ever want, wondering what um, uh, flags you can put, you can just put double dash help after any command and it'll come up with all this documentation here. It's got a lot of stuff here. Uh, you can also look this all up online. So it's got a lot of, lot of stuff. Um, usually the important stuff is at the top um, for us to do. We just press Q and then we'll exit that. So git checkout, double dash branch, and we'll do feature, GW, and we we'll call this new branch to push. I think I have made a spinner. Oh, true. apologies. I think I made an error in the the slide notes. So I think actually the command is just dash b. There we go. So apologies. I'll correct that in the in the notes um, before we and and update those. So that is correct. So just to, to remind you, so we do git checkout dash b and then the name and the new branch we want. If we do git status always going to do. Um, it says on branch feature, new branch to commit, nothing to commit, working tree clean. And we can see here there is um, uh, it, it's talking nothing about what's happening on the remote branch. And if we do um, get branch dash A, we can see the list of branches and we can see that we got new branch to push but we haven't got a equivalent one with a remote origin in front of it. So that means we haven't got a remote branch. And if we do a git push, it'll say fatal, current branch has no upstream branch. Fortunately, git is very, very useful and will actually give us the command that we need to run to set it upstream. So we're just going to type this out git push double dash set upstream and we do origin and we can give the name of the branch feature w jw new branch to push apologize for my bad typing Okay, so it's given us some information there. So remote, create a pull request. Uh, so, so this is just given some useful information or prompts of like what we should do next. Um, but the important thing is at the bottom here and it has said, we've got a new branch and it has been set to, this branch has been set to track the next one. 
So that's all very, very nice. And now if you run a git status, I'll say your branch is up to date, which is fantastic. Okay. I'm going to go back to our main branch. And now, uh, just quickly, I'm going to show you how to do it via the UA, the UI. If we go, um, if you will just look on this uh, in uh, the, the sidebar here, we've got a number of different uh, views that we can do in VS Code. One of them is called Source Control. Um, and this is just a nice, uh, this is where we can see where the, um, the UI stuff is. Got lots of different options here. Um, we also got this button down at the bottom. Uh, we got um, up next to the code spaces, uh, the name of the code space, we got this main thing here. We also got this nice little like refresh button here that just synchronizes changes with the, rem the remote. It's always nice to do. Um, and it usually come up with a um, like a one up or one down, um, depending on uh, if there's stuff you need to pull or push to the remote. So we're going to click on this button here, main, and we're going to get a presented list of um, uh, options. And we've got create a new branch or create a new branch from. Uh, just going to show you what create a new branch from looks like. So here we can specify which branch we want to um, uh, we want to create a you know, branch off of. Um, so we could go do feature, um, new branch to pull, new branch to push. Or we could do main. Um, we're going to do main, but I'm just going to go back, go close that, and just do create a new branch because that just does it from main by default. I'm going to call this feature JW dash new branch to push UI. So I'm just calling this. Um, new branch to push UI just because um, we're doing it via the UI. Um, in normal practice, you don't need to specify that you've created it via the UI. Um, it's just for the demo that I'm doing that. I'm going to press enter and it's going to be created. You can see there's nothing changes read really down here in the terminal. Um, although, if you want to get status, it will then update itself and say, oh, right, we're on. Um, we were on this nice new branch, and it you'll see it's updated down here. There's another couple of other things that have changed. So we can see here that in our source control, it's got this nice big button here saying publish branch, which is great. We can click that, and it will run the commands git push set upstream origin and the name of the thing. Um, you can also see here down where we had our little uh, refresh button, it's also got the same symbol can publish the branch. So we could just click this and it'll do this. It's come up with actually two options here, um, which just happens because we're on a forked thing. Um, so we could do upstream and origin. Um, so upstream is the name of the original um, repository that we forked from. So you can see it's the NHSR community one, but we want origin. Just going to close this. Uh, actually, well, is it good? So this this is one of the extensions that I've just got installed. Um, so you don't need to worry about, much about it. But it's a nice one that um, integrates with the GitHub pull request, which we'll look into later. Um, it just like you means you can just quickly create one automatic well quickly um, without having to go to GitHub. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do it um, the manual way. I just want to get status down here. Uh, we can see here there's nothing showing up here. Um, so it's a nice state, and we can just do git status, and it says we are uh, up to date. Let's go to check, check out main, and we're going to go back to our main branch, and we're going to clear our. Shall leave that there? For now, um, okay. So changing a branch. Um, hopefully, we we. Um, already know how to do this, but it's good to reinforce this little important school, skill. Um, so it's useful to know how to change between branches. And again, this can do, be done by the UI or the terminal. Um, 
So uh, this morning we're using the terminal, so writing git checkout feature change branches, uh, or we could do it using the UI. Um, so um, we can do use the UI controls there. And again, let's try it out and let's have a look. I'm going to quickly go into um, Git. So let's try it. I'll quickly check, create this on here. So feature W. So we're creating this new branch. Okay, this is on our remote repository. And we're going to go to our code space. And do git fetch. And to show you how we how it looks like via the UI, we could go main and we get presented. So we can see here the, the stuff we worked with earlier with the new branch stuff. However, we're interested in this stuff down here. So it's got existing branches. If you look, it looks very similar if we do git branch dash A. We can see here that we've got some similarities. So we've got JW changing branches here, and we've got changing branches here. It just hasn't got the remote in front of it, so it just cuts that off. Uh, but it does tell us it's a remote branch with the symbol and the thing at the end. So we click on it. Let's go check it out. You can see it's changed there. And if you get status, but again, the terminal doesn't update automatically. We need to run a command um, to get it to refresh. But it, it, if we run git status, even though it says main here, we can see here we're definitely on the right branch and it's updated now. Okay. So that's how we can change branches. Um, and again, we can just do git checkout um, main to switch back. There's also alternative commands called switch. Um, uh, what's it called? Changing branches. Uh, so switch um, is similar to checkout. Um, it's just another way of doing that. There's some slight differences. I just recommend always using checkout. It's the nice command. Okay. Um, I don't want to be. Here we are. Okay. Let's have a short break. Um, hopefully um, lunch isn't uh, making you too sleepy, but uh, now's the chance to have a nice uh, stretch your legs, uh, grab a coffee um, and try and shake off the afternoon um, afternoon slump. Um, so yeah, 10 minute break. Uh, so let's come back at uh, five minutes to two, let's say. Um, so yeah, I will see you then.
All right, welcome back everyone. Um, hopefully everyone's made it back from their break. Um, let's get started again. Um, and let's move on to talking about merging. So, um, there's a couple of ways you can um, think about merging. Um, uh, so, there is uh, updating your branch. So you can think of this as um, putting changes from someone else's branch into your branch. Uh, this is particularly useful if you are want to update your, your branch from uh, changes bay to main. Um, so let's say your colleague has made changes to main, uh, so they've merged in their stuff. You want to update your stuff to prevent uh, future conflicts. Uh, you can update your branch. We can also think about uh, merging in terms of merging your changes into main, um, so that can be pull request. Um, and also we're going to think about uh, merging of um, how we can resolve conflicting changes and how we can resolve merge conflicts. So first of all, um, we are going to uh, have a go at updating our branch um, and merging. So uh, you can see here, um, uh, we've got a nice little diagram here of showing sort of you you have your uh, two two branches that um, branch off of each other, and you might make a change let's say in in the update from we might make a change there and we might make a change in our other branch and we might want to incorporate the changes from update from into update two. Um, sorry, I just used my laser pointer. Um, so you have to see it. Um, so you want to merge those in, um, in into one. We can do that uh, with some nice simple um, commands. Um, the main command we want is git merge, but we want to do some stuff before this, which is uh, git checkout feature, git pull, git checkout, uh, the other branch that we can target, and we merge. And this is to make sure that we are working with the latest version of stuff, um, because uh, uh, we don't have a um, we, we don't want a situation where the remote uh, sort of our, lo our local branch that we're merging together is is different from the remote and we we don't merge in all the changes. That's quite important to do. There we go. Uh, so let's try this out and let's let's have a look and an example. So let's hop back into our code space. And here we're going to um, uh, create some new branches. So we're just going to git checkout main. I'm just going to clear things up so we can start our nice fresh repository. So uh, we're going to uh, first make git checkout uh, feature. And we'll call this update from. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this is what happens if you don't add the dash b to create a new branch. Okay, switch to a new branch, and it's going to come up the published branch. Um, so get push um, a shortcut for double dash set upstream is instead just do one dash u. So that's uh, uh, upstream. Uh, so set upstream um, origin. Okay, so we're going to push that up. Oh. Sorry about the origin feature JW update from. There we go. Sorry about the wrong command there. Okay, um, and we're also then going to go create a new branch, and we'll create it from this one. So git checkout uh, dash b feature. Now we'll go to JW update two. So switch to that new branch. And again, we're going to go git push dash u origin. Okay. 
future JW updates do. So we've created a new branch. And again, it's been set up to truck. And if we have a look at branches, we can see there that we've got update from and update to. So um, next thing we want to do is we're going to go back to um, our update from and we're going to make a change there. So we're going to go get checkout and we're going to be a bit lazy and use the dash shortcut to just go back to our previous branch and let's done that there. And we are going to go make a change. So let's go into our practice scripts and we're going to delete this file. So delete. So that's gone. We're going to run a get status. You can see that's been deleted. And also I'm going to have a look in our source control. So we can see here in our source control tab, uh, it's got that that changes there um, and just give you a bit of a tour here of, of what we can see is um, let's start from the bottom up we got a, a file that's been deleted here so it's got the little d next to it so if, I, if you hover over it you can see different things so we can open the file and have a look at what was in it if you allow me although it might not now it's been deleted we can also rev discard this change so if we don't want to delete it we can just click this button and it will just undo the changes we made we can also stage these changes we can also go here and we can stash all changes which we won't talk about um, at the moment uh, we can discard all changes and we can stage all changes so staging uh, either one or all of them is the same as doing uh, git add Actually, we'll see this in action. So we can click on here, get add um, practice scripts, delete this file. And I just use tab there um, to, to auto complete it. Um, so, so some command, command lines have, have this nice feature where you can press tab and it will try and fill out the rest of the line for you. Um, and if we press enter there, you can see here it's moved from changes to stage changes. And it's now come up with this little minor, um, this new section here and nothing in changes here. And here we can click unstage all changes and unstage changes. If you go um, get status, uh, it's also given this command here, it's saying like git restore double dash stage file. Um, to unstage it, and it's the same as clicking this button here. Um, so we could actually do this in the command line, git restore, double stage, and then we go do practice scripts, delete. And you see here, this is unstaged it. Let's stage it and git commit dash m. I'm going to say uh, delete practice this file.d. Wow. So be nice and scripted in my uh, commits. Um, I there's different ways you can like. Uh, phrase a commit, uh, it's up to you really um, or your team. I like to do it saying like, um, as if we are right at the start of each commit saying this commit dot 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 deletes practice scripts. Um, so it's a bit more descriptive. You can also just do um, delete practice scripts. It's, it's, you know, a very small difference. Um, depends how you just want to phrase things. But it's just good. Main thing is being descriptive. So we have committed that. And now we're going to seek the changes. Again, uh, we can do a status. That's going to tell us that we are ahead of our 
um, origin branch by one commit. We can see here there's sync changes, one up, and sync, uh, there's a sync changes down here, zero down, one up. So we can click one of these two buttons, and this is the same as doing a git push and git pull. There we go. Well, that's the same as doing synchronize. Okay. Now we're going to go back to our other branch. And we're just going to look here. So we can see here that that deleted file is gone. Then we're going to do git checkout dash. So we're going to switch back again to our previous branch, which is update two. You can see we've gone to the right branch. And look at that. Delete this file has has um, come back. Um, while we're here, we're just going to... Sorry, the overhead thing is going, so I'm just going to wait a second. Sorry, I'm not sure if you heard that, but someone has parked wrong or something like that in the tunnel was going off. Um, okay, um, so back into this, um, we're going to go into the README. Um, actually, let's create a new file. So we'll do um, hello.md. Going to create this new file, and we're going to say, um, let's introduce myself. And we're going to create this new file. I'm going to say, introduce myself, come in the next thing, and hello. My name is. Joe, and I work for NHS England. There we go. So create this new file. And we're going to do a get status. We can also have a look here. It says it's a untracked file. Uh, it says untracked file. Untracked just means it's new. Um, so it hasn't previously encountered it before. Um, uh, we're going to do a git add dot, so add everything in the current folder. And you can see here that it's been staged, uh, but we can double check with the status. Yep, changes to be committed. New file. Um, and then uh, git commit dash m creates in. Introduce yourself.md. Do a git push. There we go. And let's push the changes up. Or oh, we could have done this. Okay. So uh, we, we've made changes to both of these branches. However, um, in my current branch, um, I want to, in my update to, I want to update with the changes that we've made from update from. Um, so I want to have a branch where we have both deleted this file and we have introduced ourselves. So um, going back to the slide quickly to show you, show us run ourselves how we did it. We're going to git checkout our update from, we're going to pull it, we're going to check out update to, and we're going to, um, then merge them. So, get checkouts. And I'm going to be specific this time because I want to be sure which one I'm updating. Although I think we know which one it's going to automatically go back to. But update from. It's told us that it's already up to date, but I just want to be sure. So I'm just doing get pull. Already up to date. Cool. I'm nice and reassured now. I'm going to be nice and specific again about which one I want to update and merge into. Update two. Just because I don't accidentally merge into main or something, something like that. And we're going to do a get, get merge. And then we need to say which branch we want to merge into. 
Emergent. So that's going to be Okay, update from. So we're going to be nice and specific about which branch we want to merge in. If we want to learn more about the command, we can always do help. And it brings up the documentation here. Do git merge feature JW update from. Okay, so I've clicked this and it's saying, uh, waiting for your editor to close this file. Um, I believe that's just because how I've got the it set up. Um, and it's saying merge branch feature. So it's just a commit message that it's got here. Um, and also it's got this, it's popped up here. Uh, I'm just gonna close this. And now it's got a um, message saying like sync changes here. So um, an important thing to, to understand here is, because you might be thinking, oh, wait, we have one change on our, um, on update from, we only made one commit there. So why is it showing two here? It's because we've got two commits that have happened one, which is the commit that we're pulling from update from, and the second um, commit is the merge commit. And if we do a git push, it'll push those stuff up. And we can go and have a look. Which few our branches update to. Come on, these little banners are telling me to make a merge request. Uh, if you want to have a look at your merge history, you can just do the number of commits here. And we can see here, we've done um, delete practice uh, scripts, delete this file, create, introduce yourself, and then merge branch. Um, and it's from and to, excuse me. Okay, um, so this is a nice little feature on GitHub. Uh, you can nicely see all the, the commits and you can see here all the stuff going back to the start of the repository. Um, okay, let's go back to code. So that's how we can update branches. Right, pull requests. Um, so pull requests are ways you can merge into your, um, you can merge using GitHub. So, so if GitHub feature, it's not a Git feature um, and is sort of specific to the, the online platform that you're using. So on GitLab, it's called merge requests. In GitHub, it's called pull requests. Um, and it's an important part of the collaborative process. So we normally use these when you want to change, you merge your changes into the main branch. And typically we want to protect our main branch from um, in progress or unscrutinized changes that we haven't properly sort of reviewed. Pull requests allow us to assign a reviewer, allowing to someone to peer review your code. This is great to have in your coding process because it means your code can be so much cleaner, so much more understandable, um, and and a lot of good things. I'm just going to turn the light back on because it's insists on turning off after a while. There we go. Um, uh, it's important to make sure we've updated our branch before we make our pull request. Um, this can just help us um, prevent any conflicts. We can see here some of the um, the things from um, screenshots from a pull request. Um, for example, how, how we've assigned, can sign new reviewers. Um, and you can see uh, the information, uh, the different way the pull request can show the state of it. So you can say like, this branch has no conflicts with the base branch. So it's all ready to be half happily merged and GitHub will handle the merge stuff for you. So you won't have to go in and write all those commands that we've just done. Um, you can just click on a button and it'll do it for you. You can also set up um, pull requests as drafts. So let's say you've got something that's still a work in progress, but you just want to be nice and ready for um, the, the peer review. 
um, you can set this up and say this is this is a draft at the moment. Don't review it yet. It's an, um, you know, know there's still changes going on. And then you've got this nice button there uh, which says ready to for review. Um, and if you have got conflicting um, uh, conflicting changes, um, it will it will tell you it will it will tell you that there's going to be some conflicts going on. Um, so let's try out um, make and report requests. Um, so let's go into, into here. Um, so we're going to use our um, JW update two. And um, before I do this, I'm just going to um, quickly add Helen as a collaborator because uh, I want someone to review it. Um, so, so I'm just going to quickly sign in. Is this on the uh, forked repository, Joe? It is on the forked repository. Yes. Okay, cool. cool. So I've just sent it. So this is how you can add people to your own repositories. Um, you can merge access. So I'm just waiting for Helen to get the thing and a response. Yep, yeah, I should be in now. There we go. And I've refreshed it and it shows that Helen is a collaborator. Fantastic. Um, and quickly while I'm here, I'm going to show you where you can set these rules to protect your branches, which is quite important to know. Um, so we're going to go in here, go rules, oh, sorry, branches. And we're going to go in add branch protection rule. So we're going to say if the branch matches the name main, I'm going to say require a pull request before merging and require appro approvals. There's loads of different stuff going on here. So you can have status checks. Um, you could lock the branch. So if you want to have a branch that is archiving stuff, actually we've got a, a lock branch on the um, main uh, main repository, I'll show you in a minute, um, which is Rode, Rode AV, which is an archive of our 2022 uh, version of um, the uh, version of the um, the workshop. So I'm going to just create this rule and just make sure um, it is applied to the correct branch. And I'll go create a pull request. So you can see here it's got help, helpful um, tool tips coming up saying, oh, this branch has recent pushes 13 minutes ago, um, or this one has six minutes ago. So we could click compare and and um, pull request. Um, however, that's cheating. Um, and we're going to show you the, the, the full way because these might disappear by accident or stuff like that. We don't need to be left without knowing how to do this. Um, so uh, we're going to go to the pull request tab or the repository and we'll click new pull request here. Now, Git has, GitHub has got this maybe slightly annoying um, feature where by default it says, oh, uh, by default, we're going to set so the base repository, which you're going to target. So this is the first one. It's called the base, um, or you can just call it the target, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and we're going to say, all right, go back to the NHSR community one. We don't want to do that. We're going to click here. So make sure you do always check what base repository you're aiming for. Click here and say, we're going to go to the training fork. Going to update things here. Okay, and now it's, that's disappeared um, because they're on the same repository. Um, here we've got main, and it's saying there's nothing here to compare compare because we're comparing a branch with itself. So we're going to click on main, and we're going to go to update two. Okay, um, so this is called our compare or our head branch. Um, so this is where we are merging from. Okay, um, so it's got the stuff and it's going to quickly give us a preview of uh, what has changed. So we can see here the different bits. Create a pull request. Here we can write um, like a title.
Yeah, so uh, what, uh, have a look at um, the chat and has um, sort of really, yeah, discussed why uh, branch protection rules are important, um, which is uh, important to stop anyone from merging without a pull request and preventing the main branch from being updated without any review process in place. So um, back to the pull request, we're gonna open it and we're gonna give it a good title. So we could just give it the branch name, um, so how do we get to the pull request page? Uh, good question, I'm gonna quickly show you again. So we're gonna go from codes, here you go pull requests. We're gonna go over to this new pull request button here. We're gonna change our repository to the correct one. And we're gonna change the one we're comparing with to update to. And uh, we're gonna double check this is on the right one. So we definitely want to go into main. And then it's going to click, have a button here about create pull requests. And it's got a nice little link to the repository about pull requests. I think, Joe, it's kind of a good point, good moment to kind of point out that um, when you do a pull request, it's always going to be between two branches. And that's why yeah. it has the comparison kind of term. Because um, yeah. you're always going to be merging from one branch to another. You can't merge to like two branches or three branches at once. So that's yes. why it presents you the option to pick uh, your target branch and your source branch. So if you want to talk to us a little bit about that, Joe. Uh, yes. So you. So you, um, yeah. So you got the. So you mean these two branches, the, meet these two options here? Yeah, yeah. So it's always yeah. going to show because they're, they're, they're a bit hidden. If you, it's hard to see them. I think. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's make the screen a bit bigger. Um, so yeah. So this this is our. It's got a nice little arrow here of uh, what's happening. Let's do that. Um, where it's going to say, okay, what. what 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 is your target branch, and you can set that to those different ones, and it's always one to one. So, like uh, in our code space, like we had git merge, so we had one branch checked out, which is our um, head branch. Uh, sorry, our, our base branch. Excuse me. Um, so, what we want to merge into, and we're going to go git merge feature, and we're going to put here. Um, what branch we want to merge from. And that's the same as, so that's our target, and this is our source of those changes. So base and compare. Um, and yeah, we go compare this with like our base, our ground truth. Um, and yeah. It gives all this different information about how many commits we've got and what the commits were. And it's gonna give us the change change files. And we can go here and create pull request. And it comes up here with the option um, to give a bit of information about the pull request. So by default, it just gives you the branch name, um, or I believe sometimes it just gives you the, 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 the first commit. Um, but we're gonna call this um uh demo demo a pull request of uh jw merging into main and we can give extra details of what changed in here um Sometimes um, you might want to um, like have a checklist of, of different stuff going on. So like make sure that like I've checked this, this, and this, and this, um, or, or other information or like what's changed. Um, but we're just gonna leave this blank at the moment and create a pull request. Um, or we can go here and create a draft pull request. Um, before we do that, uh, so just, we can also see uh, our reviewers, our assignees, our labels, our projects and milestones. Um, so reviewers, is this the person we're going to have uh, have a look at it in peer review? So I'm going to ask them to review it. Click on them. And you just have to click. You can select multiple people and there we go. Um, to be reviewers. Um, I've only got Helen available at the moment because they're the only collaborator on this repository. 
assignees so um who's like responsible for making changes um so i'm gonna assign myself myself here so i'm assigned to it um these are optional you know they're not needed but they're very very useful like this will notify helen that they need to review it when i create a pull request labels um we use these less so less often but they could be useful if you've got a very very busy on complex repository and uh, you can just label what type of pull request it is so like a good first issue so let's say you've got a new person join your team um and you want them to re review a nice easy bit of code you can say all right look at this good first issue to have a look um or um uh, or you, you can say this is improvements to the documentation or uh you're fixing a, a bug uh, so, so, so there's lots of uh, different labels available and you can create your own ones, um, but I'm just going to leave this as is uh, and empty. Um, projects is just a feature of Git, um, GitHub, we're not going to really bother with it, and as is milestones. Uh, so again, we're not really going to worry about this. So, but these are reviewers and assignees are the important ones. Yeah, so as um, Anna said, um, uh, you, you in the in the right section, you you might add a detailed change log, um, or or yeah, changes you made to the branch. Um, so I'll quickly give you an example of a pull request here. So it's a pull request I've made. You can see I've named it. So I've put in a Jira issue, and look, I put like all this description stuff in here saying what, why, and how. So this is actually quite a nice little um, uh, method you can use to describe your pull requests. What you've done, why you've done it, and how you've done it. And also a little checklist saying like, oh yeah, I've made sure to check for spending errors and the consistent capitalization. And I've got some final uh, to-dos that I'm doing while I'm in progress. Okay, so I'm gonna create this pull request. I'm actually gonna create it as a draft pull request. Start off with. So I've created it, and you can see here what the, the pull request screen looks like. If you just have a look, quick look at the pull requests here. Um, so going back to this tab, uh, before this was empty, and now it's got our pull request in here, and it's got the number of it. So it's got one, open by my username, and it says it's in the draft. And you can see here, it's got a little token, in here, little, little symbol here that just symbolizes in draft. Okay, um, we might um, make some new changes and something like that, but I, I know this is, this is all ready for review and I want her to review it. So I'm gonna click here and click ready for review. There we go. Um, so it's gonna update it. Uh, it's gonna say it's open. Uh, so I'm gonna go change the symbol up here. If we go back to pull requests, you can see here it's, it's that's changed and it's saying review, review required. Excuse me. Um, to give us a tour around um, pull requests, so we can see here the description. So I haven't provided a description. Um, we can see the updates to what's happened with it. Um, so we can see I've made some commits. I request a review from Helen. Um, I've assigned it to myself, and I marked this pull request as ready to review just now. Um, it's telling me how I can add more commits and how I can update this history. And I'll just keep on tacking onto the end and sort of which branch I want to target. Um, and here it's got information about like the health of the of the pull request. So it's saying here, a review is required. And this is because I've set a rule um, in, in the repository um, settings. So let's go have a look at that again. Branches, and we can see here the rule is saying, uh, requires a pull request and requires approvals and it requires one approval by default before merging. So it's, it won't allow me to do that. And it, you can see here that Helen has been requested to review saying it's been blocked. Um, because I am an owner of this repository, I might know what's best. And I could click this dangerous button here saying bypass product protection and it will allow me to merge pull requests. However, that would be bad, and I'm not going to do that. 
Um, we can have a further detailed look into the commits. So we can have a look in here and look at what's happened in each one. Um, we can look here in checks. So we haven't got any checks going, but this is a very advanced feature where you can have stuff automatic run. Uh, we don't need to worry about that now. And we see the files changed. And this is a really, really useful screen. So here you can um, you can see a nice summary of everything that's that's gone on in here. Um, and this is this is great if you're going to review it. So we're just going to role play reviewing it um, as Helen. Um, so I'm going to. You can see here what what's changed. Um, um, we can see here that this file has been deleted um, by the symbol here, and we've seen this chart file has been added. We can see a summary of each of the uh, sort of the changes. Um, so this, this again, this file has been deleted. It's put a minus sign here, and this is all new. So it's nice and color coded and nice and um, correct. Um, and we're going to give it a quick review. We can see here there's little like button that comes up if we hover over these like plus or minus arrows. So I'm going to this allows to just add a little comment. So we can uh, we just click there and it just like brings up this little window to leave a comment. So I'm going to add a comment here quickly for myself. Um, I'm going to say, um, uh, why not um, use your full name? And suggest a little change. Um, GitHub is really, really nice because it's got this uh, little um, nice little feature called add a suggestion. So if you're reviewing something, and you're saying like, oh, why don't you make this change? Um, instead of just suggesting that, um, you can like make the change yourself and actually like make it much easier for the person to see what you mean and actually implement that change quickly. So I'm going to make a suggestion um, by clicking this button here. Uh, so let's brought up again. So I'm just going to leave one of those. And it's going to brought, bring up this little field here. Um, so it's got these three dashes here. Um, these little till dashes um, and uh, with suggestion and it's going to bring up the line in question that it's got here. I can make a quick change here. So I'm going to change this to uh, Joseph Wilson and I work for NHS England. Excellent. And it's got some buttons down here that we got um, available. Uh, before we click on those, uh, we've got, we can also preview what's going to happen, how it's going to look. So we can see here, I can preview it. And it's got the suggested change down here so you can clearly see how it's going to change things. If we want, we also got all these little formatting stuff. So we can like add heading text, we can add bold text. So we can make something nice and emphasized. Important you change this. Um, we can add a code block. So if you want to like, you know, give an example of some codes. Um, so again, it's got these tilts. Um, print hello world. Um, yeah, and you can like do um, bullet points, numbered lists. Um, you can do a task list. You can um, mention someone, so I can uh, tag Helen in this, um, and also can. Uh, reference stuff. So there's loads of, loads of different stuff. Oh yeah, and emojis. And I also think you can add GIFs. Um, so I can do smiley. There we go, and a little emoji. Okay, so going down to these. Um, uh, we can cancel, so we can give up and say, all right, and actually I'm not really bothered by this change. Uh, we can add this as a single comment. So this will just add it straight away, or we can get start a review. So start a review, won't post, it'll, it'll, it'll post a comment, but it'll say pending next to it. Um, and this means you can go through the code and actually go like, um, was this, um, yeah, should this actually be deleted? Um, and you can see it's pending. So these these haven't actually been posted yet, um, but we can make loads of changes and sort of batch together a load of comments. Um, this is a nice feature um, because um, you can um, 
uh, yeah, you can like batch together all your comments and then you're not like drip feeding whoever you're reviewing little suggestions and you know it's a bit distracting you can go like okay right here are all the changes you need to make you can go away in your own time and make all these changes and then come back and we can do like another just review cycle um once you're ready um, you've got this nice little review and code space that you can go and have a look at the code um but we're going to focus on this button here which is finish your review and it's got this level two next to it um we can add a final comment um Looks great if I say so myself. Um, and I've got these options to comment, approve, and request changes. I can't approve this um, and I can't request changes. That's simply because it's my own pull request, and Get GitHub is very good at not allowing you to do that. Um, so you can't, you know, self congratulate yourself, but I can comment on myself and submit a review. And now uh, I've clicked um, to review and it's updated the conversation on the first tab and has got the comment there and has got the change. Um, I can go then come through and have a review um, of, you know, I can, I can respond to these different comments by the stranger, Joseph Wilson. Um, and go through them. So let's have a look at this first one. So I've suggested, um, use my full name. So it's got here, commit suggestion. It's also got this add suggestion to batch. Um, so we go into the files changed quickly. Go add suggestion to batch. And again, we can like commit, go through and if there's multiple suggestions and multiple comments, we can commit those together. So let's commit this. Actually, before I do that, I'll remove from batch. I can also just straight away commit it. Um, just individually. Um, so in commit suggestion, it's got a little like pop up here so I can um, adjust this, say like apply, you can do like different um, commit message, but I'm gonna leave it as is, because it's nice and uh, direct and commit that. You can see here now the um, that comment has disappeared. So if we load the diff here, it, this comment is still here. And if we go into conversation, you can see here that this has, uh, oh, where is it? Oh, it's just disappeared. Um, oh, there we go. Outdated. So it's still here. So it's been closed. So I've made this change. It's mar if you realize, all right, this has already been changed. It's outdated. And because um, I made this change and committed it and, and it's outdated, GitHub has nicely resolved the conversation. But if you look at the top here uh, in files changed, it's actually, um, oh, it hasn't got it. It sometimes comes up with like a list of like, oh, right, there's, there's a number of um, unresolved conversations. I think just how I've got it, it's hard to see. Um, but I can go through and respond to the comments saying, no. I can respond to this saying, nope, this is correct, to this comment here. And I can resolve the conversation. So saying like, this is done and it's resolved. So um, Helen has been assigned the review. Um, and you can see in the chat. And um, GitHub has sent uh, Helen a email notification. And it's got links to the pull request, uh, saying it needs, needs the attention, and uh, links the PR and the repository. Um, Helen, could you give it a quick review and hopefully approve it? Yes, of course. So at this point, um, Joe would uh, book in a call with me at some point so we can uh, have a review process so we can go over his code or any kind of changes uh, Joe has made. And we'll just kind of like talk them through and um, if there are any kind of suggestions or any kind of uh, changes to make, then Joe would go uh, go and make those changes. But otherwise, um, we would normally go ahead and approve the um, pull request. Um, so um, yes, so I have an email and it links 
the, the link leads back to the um, pull request. And I basically, when I open the pull request, I see exactly exactly the same page as Joe is showing us right now on the um, on the on, on screen. I don't know if there's um, uh, should I also share my screen, Joe? I don't know if there's any yes, thing I could sh yeah, show. Share Maybe I could show them. Yeah, approving the the review. I guess. Yeah, I can do that. Um, uh, okay, just quickly, just quickly showing my screen. Okay. Um. So yep. Yeah back on the uh, pull request page. And uh, as I previously mentioned, it's the exact same information um, as Joe had. Again, I have my tabs here, commits, checks. I can look at files changed. I can look at all kinds of comments, anything that's changed. I can go through the various changes. And, um, uh, Hang on a second, let me just quick, quick refresh. Okay. And then when I click review changes, I get the extra options that Joe didn't have because he was not the uh, reviewer for the specific pull request. So yeah, if there were if I've noticed anything that needed to change, then I would request changes and submit submit my feedback. I just write a few comments saying that, oh, you need to change this. But everything seems absolutely fine. So I'm just gonna hit the approve button. Submit review, and the uh, health status of the pull request. Instead of red, now it's turned to green, and it says changes have been approved by one reviewer. You can sign one more than one reviewer. You can sign other reviewers as well. You should like to do that. Um, uh, this branch has no conflicts. Everything's good, and then. If you click here on this drop down before hitting the merge pull request button, you get some extra options here. Um, so you can squash and merge, you can rebase and merge. Basically, these two extra options uh, they affect the commit history of the repository. Um, we usually use either the first one or the second one. The second one is basically it reduces the commit history. Um, so for example, if I have a branch and I have lots of commits, which do not really contain useful commit messages. So for example, maybe I'm correcting a document and every time I make a commit, my commit message is fixed typo, fixed typo, fixed typo. And you can see how that's not very useful to keep, to retain that as the commit history for the repository. So in that case, I would opt for squash and merge. Basically it merges all the commit messages into one, uh, commit message. Um, and the third option, it kind of does something similar, um, but uh, I won't go into detail because it kind of gets, a bit, it's a bit hard to understand what exactly it does sometimes. I'm just going to opt for this first option and just hit the merge pull request uh, button and it's asking me to commit the, uh, to confirm the commit message that it's going to show. Okay, yeah, everything seems good. And yeah, cool. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, so I'll share my screen again. Okay, um, so we can see here um, that it has updated on my screen as well and has said, uh, the pull request is successfully merged and closed. Um, and it's going to have this nice little button saying delete branch. Um, it's also got this nice little button called revert. So if uh, you've realized that you've made a bit of a mistake and, oh wait, a critical bug has been merged into the, um, the main branch, you can revert it. There is this nice little button here um, to uh, revert, the, revert the changes and it will create a new pull request and and um, a, a, a reverted um, commit is just, you know, just does the opposite operations. So it just mirrors it. Um, um, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're not going to look into it, but you just know it's an option. There is a, there's a back out button if you ever have a problem in the future. Um, 
and we can yeah uh, delete the branch so i'm not really interested in uh, keeping this branch around um uh so i could keep the the sort of list of branches nice and clean and just delete it um it's also got sort of delete code space i'm going to keep that there um and uh, update the code space in a minute Um, and if I go into back into code, uh, so it's got this nice new commit from Helen, and it's got some. Um, uh, if we have a look at the branches here, it's got a list of branches, and you can see here it's now missing uh, update from. Uh, so we're keeping it nice and clear, and it's it's good for, for every so often uh, to have a look at the, your your branches. Have a look, give them a quick review, see which ones are active, um, and see which ones are are stale. So it actually will come up with stale branches that haven't been changed in a while, um, and you can you can delete them from here. Um, important thing to know: the branch is deleted here. However, if we go onto a code space here. Actually, can we restart? She might not show it now. Let's hit wake up again. So hopefully it will still be in that branch. There you go. So it's still in that branch. And we can do a get status. And it looks quite happy. But if we do a get push. Oh, actually, it might have worked. Oh, it beat it. There we go, it's come back there. So it, it, it does it does sort of um you can almost restore a branch from um your local repository um even though it has been deleted on the on the remote repository um so that's a, a nice little alternative um you know if you accidentally delete something and but i'm just going to quickly delete this again and get rid of it um go and if i do get fetch Prune. There we go. Uh, get fetch prune. Um, we'll just um, we will um, uh, it, it will, it will fetch the information of what what's been deleted online and and update that stuff. There we go. Um, so uh, if we do a get status now, it will um, say, oh, it's based on this origin feature update two, but that's gone. Um, uh, so, and it'll give you information about how you can unset that. Um, however, because we're done with this branch, both remotely and locally, I'm going to delete it. So I'm going to use the command git branch, uh, dash D, actually, sorry, I'm going to git checkout main, so we're off on a nice, healthy branch. Um, we're going to resolve that in a second. And we go git branch dash d feature um, jw uh, name update two. It's going to come up message saying that it is not fully merged. So that's just locally it means. And we're going to do git branch capital D. So uh, that's deleted it. And now if we get checkout and try and go back to that, it's not going to be very happy because it can't get back to it. We can be more specific and try and get back to it. That's not going to work. And get branch dash A is going to confirm that we have deleted it. So it's deleted both locally and remotely, that's completely lost now. 
So that's how we can. Um, so that's how we can delete a a branch. Um, we're just going to make sure we're nice and updated now. And we're going to, so we could do a you click one of these sync changes button. But again, I recommend using the command line for this stuff and do a get pull. There we go. And it's most of those changes be made. Right. Um, let's go to the presentation. Let's talk about merge conflicts. So Git is an extremely powerful control uh, tool, and it's sort of um, and, and while it can do a lot, like merging branches together and sorting out how the, all these complementary changes can go together, sometimes um, if there is situations where there's conflicting changes, it will need your help um, to do this. So conflicts are usually changed by the same lines of code being changed on, on both branches that you merge in together. Um, the conflict won't happen it, while you, you are you know, just working on the set branches and commissions to do is when you run the git merge that it will it'll run into an issue and and run into a conflict. So whenever you, you run the git merge command, it will attempt to automatically merge the branches. So like we did when you updated the branches and did a pull request. But when it encounters a conflict, it will stop auto merging and show a conflict error, highlighting when the files uh, where the files were uh, with, with conflicts are occurring. Um, th this will be like, you know, a big error message. It can be a bit scary, a bit like, oh, God, what's happening? Um, a lot of peering that you're not used to. However, it's actually quite a useful error message. Um, like quite a lot of the, the messages that Git has, they're very useful and very, very direct in telling you what to do. Um, so here we've got an example of a, of a conflict error. So um, it'll say also merging practice uh, so in this, in this thing, same we're saying our oh, temperatures function .pi file is, is being is being merged, um, and it says conflict. Um, there's been a merge conflict in this file. Um, automatic merge has failed. Fix the conflicts and commit the result. So it's saying like, can you go away, look at this file, um, fix whatever the conflicts, and and commit the result. And it will just tell you where those conflicts are and go like, all right, just go and like sort it out. It'll put um, both, but the, it'll put the conflict into the file or mark them in the file um, and and clearly mark where they are and everything else that's, that can, uh, can automatically merge will happen. So this is a really, really nice feature. It's like, yeah, it will, it will sort out everything that's not conflicting and tell you directly just where you need to look for the conflicts. So, how can you view the merge conflicts? So different editors give us different tools for handling these merge conflicts, um, but the prin principles may remain the same between all of them. So like VS Code has like a three-way merge editor that you could use, um, but we're just going to look at the, the sort of the one based on sort of pure Git. Um, so what it will do is if you open up the file list in the conflict error or the files, um, you can scroll down to find the conflict and it will be marked by these strange lines. So it will say heads, and then it will say like, my name is Joe and I work for NHS Digital, um, which should be NHS England. Um, and then it will have these equal signs, this like um, uh, demarcation, and it will have an I am, and then the, 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 I have a conflicting change and saying this is where it's coming from. So it's came, coming from conflicting branch. Um, while I'm talking about this, Helen, could you, um, Go make a conflicting change on the, the main branch, please. Um, so I can show how this is going to look like. Is this the, um, sorry, which uh, file? Um, is it the introduce yourself? Uh, yes, if you can do the introduce yourself and um, put something okay. in there. Um, if you can just add like a, yeah, a, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make sure to change the file as well. And on, on the, the, my name is so and so, and I work for NHS uh, Digital. Um, uh, so yeah, so it'll come in like this. Um, so the top bit is is the, is what we have in our branch currently, and that's represented by the head statement. Uh, you'll see head pop up quite a lot in Git. Heads means 
um, basically uh, the head is like where Git is currently pointed to in like if you think of like the whole tree of of Git commits and like branching out and everything like that head is like where you are so like saying all oh, right the previous commit was this and these are the changes that we've got in in our in our current repository um so uh that's what the head is um so where you currently are and the bottom bit is the incoming changes um and so this is in this example it's coming in from a uh, feature jw conflict and branch so this is what's coming in um these the, all this so, text oh, sorry, sorry joe <laughs> yeah sorry joe I, ca I can't do it because um i don't have the permissions <laughs> oh, do you, have you, do you need to make a pull request yeah, i need to make a pull request um so i don't know if you can go to settings and change my permissions or something like that um if you just create a pull request uh, create a pull request i'll quickly go and um i'll prove it and merge it in um Okay. Example. Sounds good. Um, uh, so yeah, so the bottom bit is is the incoming stuff. To resolve them, um, again, uh, different IDEs have different tools, but to resolve them, um, we can just simply go in and edit it ourselves. So these this would be written in the file, and we can go and delete the line that we do not wish to keep, as well as anything else to mark in the conflicts. Um, so let's say we want to keep the, like my name is Joe and I work for NHS Digital. Um, we will just delete the head line. We will delete this, uh, the, the sort of these line of equals and this imposter line and we delete the bottom line as well. Um, once we've resolved all the conflicts, um, we can then stage and commit our merge. And we'll see how that looks in our um, in our status uh, message. If we want to cancel the merge, like we need to go away and discuss. Let's say there's there's loads of really con conflicting uh, conflicts, and that it's very complex. And I need to go and have a meeting with Helen to like, okay, work out what what changes we made, why we made them, and stuff like that. We don't have to leave it halfway through a merge, we can just run this command called git merge at double dash abort. Um, and that'll just simply reset things to our how we were before the merge. And we can come back, come do it later. Um, uh, GitHub has a, a nice online tool that will allow us to do this stuff free merge requests. And I'll show you how that looks in a minute. But again, it, this, this is how it looks in the file. And I'll just mark it out. Um, and and we can go and, and, and sort things out. Okay, let's go try it out. Um, so, I'm gonna quickly um, git checkout, uh, definitely gonna create a new branch called feature GW completing change. And I'm going to go to introduce yourself. I'm going to change this back to Joe. I prefer being called Joe most of the time. Um, get status, get commit, uh, sorry, get ads, and everything. Then get commit dash M. Uh, um, changes. My name back to Joe in introduce yourself to MD. Okay, git push dash u origin um, and it's going to be future GW change. There we go. Get status. Lovely. Okay, and I'm going to go into my pull requests. Okay, so I can see here quickly Helen has made a change here. And I'll quickly review that. 
Oh, I'm sure that's fine. Yeah, let's, let's approve that change. That's going to have no bad consequences at all. So this is just Helen's pull request. And I'm going to merge that. Confirm merge. Lovely. Let's sort out my branch. Um, okay. Uh, so new pull requests. Again, change the base repository to here. And change that moment to your main. Double check that. Yep. And click the change. Great. Oh, wait. Can't automatically merge. Huh. I wonder if there's going to be a conflict. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've got, we've got an issue here. Um, and we'll just create pull request. I'm going to leave this as is quickly. Create pull request. Sign Helen as the reviewer because I need someone to review it. Sign myself and create pull request. Okay. So it has come through with some issues. So first hand needs to review it um, and also it has conflicts that must be resolved. It's got this nice button saying here called resolve conflicts. So we click on here and it will bring up uh, what we talked about earlier. Um, so actually instead of heads, it's got this, the branch name here, feature, conflict and change and main. Um, and I could go through and alter this and sort of resolve this conflict. And mark it resolve. Um, however, I'm not gonna do that just yet um, because I want to show you how it looks like in uh, in the terminal, uh, in, in, in when you're working in locally. Because, uh, so, you, so you could do, you could do this stuff here. However, um, sometimes you might want to do it actually in, in your code and in your in your code space here. So um, uh, we're going to resolve this um, by checking out main. And let's say we just we want to update our uh, our conflicting change branch and make sure there's no no issues. Um, so I'm going to pull in the change here. Okay, you can see that's got now imposter and imposter ink. I'm going to check out conflict change and get merge main. So we're going to update our branch with what was on main. And we can see here, again, it's going to come up with this um, this conflict message. I'm just going to close this. Um, and we can see here it's, it's got the the where the merge conflict is. And actually I can control click this and it will open up here. Now, um, VS Code and Code Spaces have this really nice feature where you can, where it would like nicely highlight it. You can go and navigate with buttons up here and go into the next merge conflict. There's only one in here, so it's come up with the same. There are other merge conflicts in the file. It's got these buttons here um, saying, What's the current change? What's the incoming change? We can sort of accept, sorry, accept the current change, accept the incoming change. So it's bottom one, um, both changes or compare changes. So we're going to go here. I'll just show you what happens with each. So I'm going to click accept current change. And it'll just have the top line there and also has to delete the stuff for us. Or I could go, I just control Z there. Um, I could do, oh, accept incoming change. I want to keep the imposter there. Or I could go, actually, both are fine. I'm going to have both instructions. And I'll just add both in, one after the other. Or compare changes. And it will just bring up a different view uh, where you can more clearly see what, what's, uh, what the differences are uh, in a different file. Um, we've also got this thing saying, like, resolve and merge editor. This is just a different way of, like, viewing these and resolving them. Um, so if you bring it up, um, 
you, you can you can see here it's got now three windows it says incoming so these are helen's changes and it's nicely highlighted here and it's saying current so this is what my changes here so i can click accept incoming accept current let's go down here what the result is it's up to you what way you want to do this i personally prefer working working like this and and having a look at the, the changes like this uh, don't say this uh, there we go um so um we're going to keep it like this so we're going to say accept current change and we're going to look in our um our source control thing here and it's actually got this new bit here called merge changes okay, i'm going to undo this quickly and just show you what happens um if i try and commit this we're about to do it Okay. Abort. Oh, there we go. Abort it. Uh, something slightly has gone wrong. I'm just going to abort it and it's going to revert things back. There we go. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I've gone to merge these changes without actually um, uh, stage these changes without actually sorting a merge conflict. Let's go count this this um, error here. Um, I'm going to cancel this and actually fix it. Um, so I'm going to delete this line and I'm going to delete this line. There we go. Give it a save. And then I'm going to get get add and then get commit. Um, so I can write out the message here. However, VS Code is really nice and actually has already uh, given the command here. That's a bit laggy. push okay so uh let's go back into this pull request okay refresh and now it, this message has changed from there is a conflict and it's now waiting for a viewer um Helen, could you give just quickly a proof and then we can Merge it in. Actually, no. I'm gonna merge. Be naughty. Yeah, yeah. You can. You can also do that. I just wanted to kind of point out uh, something uh, I added in the chat as well. Um, yeah. That when there's merge conflict, if this is a collaborative, pro if this is a solo project, yeah, you can handle it yourself. Obviously, if this is a collaborative project, um, it's very important to contact um, whoever has written the previous version in the main branch and if there's a merge conflict to uh, communicate with your colleague to uh, find out the reason behind the conflict and figure out the correct version uh, sometimes there might be a misunderstanding sometimes it's an honest mistake sometimes it can be you know all kinds of um, reasons yes so yeah. yeah always good to yeah uh, discuss things before you do things um so I'm going to merge without waiting for a client to be met because um, Maverick. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you what squash and merge looks like. Um, 
just see edification. Uh, so it's Gosh and Merge. And um, it's going to come up with this merge message. And it's got this um, hash three. So um, this is referring to, again, like the, the, the pull request message and the pull request number. So each pull request is numbered. Um, and, and this is nice because um, I, I can't remember if you were discussing it earlier about um, uh, the um, uh, about what like commit how often you should commit and then what you should have in each commit and the commit message. So um, this this sort of squash merge is quite important because it it, it compresses a lot of changes down into one uh, commit. However, this then links back to your pull request. So if someone's looking at the, the commit history, they can then have a look at the pull request and um, and have a look at what's happened and you know and, and what actually happened in in, in this bit. Um, so uh, I've merged this, um, and I'm going to go to the main branch. Um, and you can see here uh, in the latest commits, it's got this number three, and I can click here and see. All right, in this squashed uh, merge, and I, I can see that all this stuff went on, and I can see all, all right, this is the discussion that happened and stuff like that. So this, this is a really nice feature. Um, but uh, the reason you will would squash is just so your commit history is not so super long. Um, so if I was if I was working on a feature branch, um, I might have you know ten or or fifty commits going on there, implementing a feature. Like if it's very very difficult to implement. Um, however. Uh, that's really important for someone reviewing it to see what okay what I've done what I've attempted and why I've done that. However, um, in the future, um, when we're looking back over the commit history and when something was implemented, um, so let's say my feature broke something in the future and we went all right when did this happen why did that happen? We can we we don't have to crawl back through all these like. Uh, change this little thing. Change this little thing. We can we can have a look at this big pull request change and go like, all right, this is everything that changed here, um, and 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 quickly pass the commit history, and then if we want to go, okay, right, something happened in in here that went wrong. Uh, we can click on this and we can have a look through the commit history, and let's go have a look at all, like what's happened. What's happened here? Why has this happened? Um, uh, we can we can dig into it. Right, um, so let's have another short break. Um, let's have a, um, yeah, just a bit over 10 minute break. And um, we will then be on the uh, final stretch and we'll just be like wrapping things up and should be all done uh, by four o'clock, I think. Um, if you have any questions, this this was, this was a very, um, dense bit of the of the workshop um we covered some quite important stuff if you have any questions i really, really recommend just asking them doesn't matter if you think they're silly i, I guarantee they're not silly they're very all, all all questions are really useful and um and when i started learning this stuff i had plenty of what i thought was stupid questions which were actually really useful for me to know um so yeah um we come back at um, 25 past um, and uh, feel free to put your question in the chat before then um, and yeah and then we'll be on the final stretch and talk about some uh, general goods uh, get stuff and point you towards some uh, useful resources um, but yeah I'll see you at uh, 3.25. It's a question in the chat Joe about the recording if um... If you remember the answer, I think these are going to be on YouTube. I think that's what Zoe said at the yes. start of the workshop. Yeah, okay. So this should be available on YouTube. That's um, good, yeah. You should be able to look back on it. 
at some point. All right, see you in 10 minutes.
Right. Um, hopefully people are back from their last break. Um, can't see if <laughs> can't see if anyone's back. Um, I'm still sharing my screen. Um, are you back, Helen? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. Let's get going again. And yeah, go and have uh, the last little bit before we finish up for the day. Um, before we get started, um, does anyone have any questions um, that they want to shout out um, or put in the chat about what we've covered? Um, I'll, I'll wait a moment. Um, if not, I will crack on with the, the final bits. Okay, I'm going to, there we go. Okay, get bash. Um, so, um, what get bash is, is a nice little tool um, um, that you can download on Windows to interact with, with Git. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, because we're using code spaces, it comes already set up with, um, our Git tools installed. Um, yes, so via the code spaces terminal. So if you look here, um, we're using bash. Uh, so bash is the name of a, uh, terminal sort of, um, uh, set up, uh, so. I can't remember what it stands for. Um, yeah, but it's a shell. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's how we, we type in the command. You might have heard of like PowerShell or command line in, in Windows. Those are both shells. Um, they're slightly different and, you know, Windows specific. Um, the, you, so you can download um, Git Bash, which is a Bash terminal for Windows um, for, for talking with Git, and it's all nicely set up for you. Um, so if I uh, let me try and get rid of this, there we go. Um, so if I do Git for Windows, there we go. So if you download this, um, uh, you can you can get um, get set up on, on your Windows machine. Um, and yeah, it provides um, bash emulation to run git commands, uh, git from the command line. Also comes with a GUI and uh, credential manager. Um, uh, so the, the, the reason we're doing code space is because we didn't want to go through the steps of setting this up and having to do that. Um, but if you have a look, um, I think I've got it installed in the thing, yep. So git bash. I can you can see here it is looks fairly similar to our um, our code spaces terminal um, and uh, I'm not sure if I've got a uh, thing set up already but if I do a git clone I just want to show you like what it looks like I'm just gonna show you how to clone down something so I'm gonna go um, to the repository code clone, and I'm going to copy this here. I uh, should have it all set up. I'm going to run the git clone command. Let's copy this again. There we go. Um, if you do this on your own machine, it might come up like asking for credentials. You just need to sign up and sign up to GitHub. Um, uh, but yes, uh, if we cd into Git Training Forts, yeah. So you can see here, it's now come up with the name of the, the folder that we're in in main. So it looks it looks a lot like like this. Um, however, it's just got a different. So here, it's got the at. 
uh, Joseph Wilson NHS, and here it's just got information about my um, laptop, just the laptop name and stuff. Um, so yeah, so let's get bash. Um, so yeah, just a way to interact with Git from from your uh, thing. Again, the reason why we're using code spaces because we didn't have to go through the setup of that stuff. Um, some people's machines won't allow them to install this stuff onto it. They might be locked down. So it's just nice and easy. We can get everyone going on this. Um, and and code spaces cuts out that clone part because it, it automatically does it for you and clones it out. Um, so GitHub desktop uh, does this essentially do the coding part for you. Um, so um, with the coding part, do you mean like running the commands? Uh, yes, it's, it, it, will, it will allow you to, like, like we have with the source control over here, it will allow you to run, um, uh, run uh, the commands through a, through a, um, a GUI, a, a user interface. However, um, uh, we uh, like to, to, to always recommend when you're picking up Git for the first time, just, and I know I know that the GitHub Desktop thing, GUI, really nice. And that is 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 feature rich. It's really good. But I always recommend just getting used to using Git through the command line to start off with. Um, uh, just because it, it it allows you to start understanding how how it's working, what it's doing a bit better, um, and. Um, and and you know if something goes wrong, again Git is very good at telling you what right commands you need to run and stuff like that. Um, another thing as well, um, let's say we get into a pickle and something's gone wrong, um, we can um, we can then use Google and go like, oh I got this error message from my output, like oh let's say like. Uh, you get an error saying like, "Oh, there's a detached head," um, which sounds very dramatic. It just means like um, you've you just got the code out and you haven't got any Git history there. Um, so you've got this this the same thing, detached head. Um, you can Google that error and it will say, "All oh, right, yeah, you need to run these commands to fix it." So so knowing looking through those commands and knowing what they're doing and sort of getting an idea for what they're doing can be very very helpful. Um, uh, rather than if you were on GitHub desktop and using that GUI or using the VS Code GUI, if something goes wrong, it, it can be really hard to sort of pick yourself out of it. Um, so yeah, a uh, good way to learn um, is, is, is via the thing. Once once you're used to, used to using the commands, you're very comfortable, then switch to using a GUI, switch into UI. That's what I did. Um, just because it's a bit quicker, it's a bit more user friendly, and if something does go wrong, I can then switch back to the commands, be very specific, and and work out from there. I think an, another sort of benefit to you knowing to understanding Git commands is that um, they are language agnostic and yep. they're universal. So. Um, Programming languages do come and go. So like decades ago, everyone was using Fortran and Pascal and other languages. Now everyone's using Python and R and now it's moving on to different languages, maybe in 10 years time. But Git is still Git, like people are still using Git commands and it doesn't matter what kind of, I mean, VS Code might not be a thing anymore. It might be a different kind of interface that you might use as a programming language editor or GitHub might not be a thing, it might be called something else. But using Git commands and version control, that is something that hasn't changed in a very, very long time. So being able to use Git commands and terminals and the command line, as Joe said, it's very easy to switch from one uh, software to another, basically, because the main core of version control, that hasn't changed. So yeah, it's just something to think about in terms of um, uh, future proofing your uh, knowledge as well and adaptability, um, so to speak. Um, but yeah. 
Yeah, um, tech the companies are never known for changing the user interface in a way that disrupts its users at all, <laughs> or putting things behind a paywall. Um, so, um, actually, yeah, that's, that's something that's happened to me recently as I use an extension called Git Bands, and they use, they've recently gone from a free version to like a a freemium version, and a feature I was using called like the the um, a, a way I could look at the the a graph of the Git history, um, which is great for like um, resolving very complex like issues of the Git history to have a look at it in a, a visual form. They've now hidden that behind their paywall. Um, so now I've had to learn how to run the commands to produce that now. Um, so yeah, uh, right. Um, what else we got? Uh, I think I think that's everything. Um, all the questions. Uh, so yeah, let's get on to um, the the next bit. So yeah, uh, general guidelines. So uh, we sort of touched on these already, uh, um, but this is just a reminder to reinforce these important concepts. Um, uh, so your main branch should be kept in a good stable state. Um, so you can do this by by adding rules and protecting it um, in in the um, in the repository settings. Um, and even if that rule is not set, we can't set it. Um, you can uh, you can just practice it yourself and just make sure you're not directly committing onto the main branch. Um, you should use feature branches. You should branch use branches. Um, uh, and 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 take them off the main branch and work on them instead of working on the main branch. Feature branches should be short lived. Um, you sh you shouldn't be planning to um, have a feature branch uh, that that will that will stick around for a long time and go stale. Um, uh, if if that is happening, um, you it's more likely that a conflicting merge will happen or there'll be there'll be challenges later. Um, if it is long lived, if it's unavoidable, um, A, you have a look at like how you have approached this feature, whether you could broken that feature down into smaller chunks, more digestible. Um, and make sure to regularly update it. So remember where we did the merge earlier, so merge from main into your feature branch and just keep it up to date, keep it fresh. Um, if, if it is uh, stale and like it's a feature that you have abandoned um, and it's hung around, uh, after a while, consider deleting it and just cleaning up and make and just keeping your um, uh, your repository both online and locally nice and clean. Um, pull requests are super useful um, and they re I really think they should be used. Um, uh, and and review should be completed by your collaborators um, when you're merging back into main. So that really helps you keep your main branch nice and stable and clean. Um, uh, with your like, who's doing a review? Um, it, it, it's it's really good to to work out your team who's doing it. And usually, it should be everyone on the team that should be reviewing code. Both your senior developers that really know what the code base is, and your more junior members and people that are on boarded. Um, I we typically pair up, so like a senior person reviewing a junior person's, or a junior person reviewing the senior person's. Um, that's good. Usually, good combinations to have. Other combinations are viable. Um, this means that a junior person can look at a senior person's code and learn from it, and learn what they're doing. And a senior person can make sure the junior person is, is writing good code and suggest how they can improve it. Um, uh, although if it's a very, you know, a very critical piece of like the, uh, the code base, maybe you want a senior person reviewing the senior person's code. So yeah, just think about how you're gonna you're gonna pair people up. Um, but yeah, sharing knowledge is a great uh, uh, through reviews is a great method and really, really organic method. Um, uh, once a um, pull request um, has been approved and merged, uh, again you should trim that feature branch and you should delete it. Um, 
that just keeps your repository nice and clear and, and means that you're not having to crawl through a long list of branches um, to, to find uh, the one you want and the, and the important one. Um, so if you, have, if you have a quick look at our, um, uh, da -da -da -da. if we have a quick look at the branches on here, we've got quite a few different branches. Uh, so this merge one, let's delete that. Um, and yeah, we could we could delete all these branches from our from today's exercises and just make it nice and clear. Um, if we have go and have a look at the main um, thing here, it's nice and clear. We've got this archive branch uh, that I was talk alluded to earlier um, uh, that is protected and is is last year's workshop um, and we've got the main one we haven't got any of the other stuff even though if we look in pull requests we can see here that we've had quite a lot of different branches come through um, and be merged in but we just deleted those kept them away uh, this is also useful um, if we look here get branch a we can see here, we've got lots of branches here. So I might want to go through here in my own time and clean these up and delete branches that have been merged. Okay. Um, so um, now you're familiar with GitHub and, um, and Git, um, I really rec recommend that you go and um, use your knowledge and curiosity to sort of explore interesting other repositories. So we've got some links here to some um, uh, other repositories that are out there. Um, so again, we've got the uh, Git training repository that we've already uh, been working on today. Uh, we've got the RAP community practice. Um, so this is um, the RAP squads. Um, uh, this is our repository here. And you can see here, um, uh, this, is, this is where we make our websites, which also re recommend you looking at. Um, on wrapped concepts. And here, actually, I'm also going to plug. So we've got some training resources and we've got some very, very similar um, Git training resources. Um, so you can have a look at that. And um, that will just lead you through all the quite a lot of the similar stuff we've talked about today. Um, what other repositories we've got? Uh, we've got some great R data sets from the NHSR community. Go have a look at that one. Um, and we got a really nice um, uh, uh, rep repository uh, of the speaking, smoking, drinking, and drug use uh, report code. Uh, so this is how they produce this. It's a uh, rep pipeline. So you can go have a look through here and have it explore. And. And also we got this, um, another NHS Digital one, uh, or former NHS Digital one, um, which is our um, uh, NHS UK React component. So these are like components that you can use to build a website. So yeah, go and have an explore. Um, and yeah, if, you, if you're going through like particularly the rep community practice, if you go like, oh, there's an issue here, you can go into here. And we didn't, haven't discussed about this in, in GitHub, but you can raise issues. So you can like, like a pull request, you can raise an issue and uh, flag an issue by like basically flag an issue with a code. Um, and yeah, uh, it's, it's quite a nice little feature. And that you can say like, oh, I think this is an improvement that you can make. Um, like it, think of it like a suggestion box. So yeah, if you're going through a code base, you spot an issue, uh, flag it up, be a good citizen of, the, of GitHub. Um, uh, yeah. Um, if you find a very interesting repository that has some really interesting code that you want to reuse, you fork it. Um, so you have your own copy to alter and use. Uh, just remember when you're making pull requests that the default will be set to the original repository, not your forked one. So remember to change that. Um, and um, and yeah, use the code as a package in another project. So there's a way you can like um, to, to, to use that and, and import it in. Uh, so as Helen said in the document uh, in the chat, it can concern bug, bugs in the code, um, but can also be simple as a typo in documentation. So uh, useful resources. 
Um, uh, uh, so we've got the NHS England RAP community of practice. Again, that's, that's what I showed you before. Um, and that's got our, uh, our training materials on Git. Um, and it's got walkthroughs and stuff like that and quick start guides. So if you do end up using um, Git on your uh, on your computer, it's got information about how you can get that set up. Um, GitHub has a really good cheat sheet. So that's got all your commands here. So you don't have to remember them. You could you could just have this um, you could have this bookmarked or printed off and pr put on your wall. And it has all like the different uh, stuff, that, even stuff we haven't uh, covered today. So uh, let's go down here. Yeah, if you want to like undo all the commits uh, after a certain commit and preserving changes locally, you could just reset hard. Um, oh, sorry, the, this, this, yeah. And if you want to like erase mistakes and um, and all, all do the undo stuff, yeah, you can do this stuff. Um, you can create a new repository locally, get a git in it. Um, Loads of stuff, loads of stuff. Um, we also got the um, Git docs itself. So this is a really, really good book of um, and reference manual that you can have a read through. And this is actually how I learned Git initially as I read through this. Um, it's a bit heavy um, at points, a bit complicated. Um, but I think it's worth read through if you're very interested about Git's like un underlying stuff and you like getting very technical. Um, uh, so yeah, it, and then also just good to reference and have a look at the documentation. Um, what else have we got? Um, if you are, are using our Studio user, uh, there's a guide on how to use Git with R and R Studio, and also um, some really good Git tutorials. A bit buckets orientated. Um, Oh, is the link working? Okay, I'm not sure what's going wrong with the, um, the tours there, but um, when I've used them before, they've been really nice and um, easy to read and nice. They've got nice diagrams in them. Um, uh, here's a great um, uh, XKCD comic. Uh, which seems to always have a relevant comment, uh, comic for what we're talking about. Um, but yeah, uh, you do you do very much memorize the shell commands at, at start um, and just type and type them to sort of like sync your codes. And if you get errors, you just save your work elsewhere and delete the project and download a fresh copy. Hopefully, you won't be doing this after this tutorial. Um, but I have found myself getting an error which I can't fix and going like, well. Okay, let's reclaim this and <laughs> start again. Um, saving what changes I made, of course, so I don't lose a load of work. <laughs> um, I am this friend who who does understand Git and, and will talk deeply about, oh, if you think about branches, always think about, oh, how what a remote is. Um, you will gloss over. Okay, uh, yeah, if you want to get in contact with us, uh, please do so. Um, uh got the email to the data science mailbox at nhs um so try and help you also just the nhs our stack community and the government data science sort of communities really good really really helpful i recommend signing up to slack and and getting and you know if you have an issue um you know uh reach out on here there will be people that are really happy to help you um and yeah um you've got our uh uh, GitHub addresses it here, um, so you can have a look at, you know, if you want to snoop on the stuff we're working on online and the public, you can do. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for coming along. Um, any any final questions? Um, we finished with 10 minutes to spare, so we've got plenty. Actually, while I wait for any questions to come through, I've just got a phone call coming through, so I'm just going to... Sorry about that.
Okay, um, if you have any questions, I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. Shall we call it there then, Hem? I'm just uh, reading the comments in the chat. Uh, some very nice feedback for us, Joe. That's great to hear. Feel free to blow your trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, thank you all for coming. And um, I think at least when I was learning how to use Git for the first time, it was terrifying because uh, I was also not familiar with using um, a command line. So like Git bash or a terminal. So everything was very much new to me. Um, but what really helped uh, was practice, 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 practice. Uh, unfortunately, Git does have a steep learning curve because it's not exactly a programming language, is it? It's just a, it's just a set of commands. And I mean, those, if anyone has used shell, before, shell commands and they can use shell in general just to kind of, in, in, the, in their day-to-day -day kind of uh, role, they will probably have an advantage um, but um, if you haven't used the terminal before, yeah, it can be quite quite the learning curve. Um, so I do recommend practicing the um, the basic git command workflow, git status, git add, git status again, git commit, git status, git push, creating branches on GitHub. Um, with repetition, eventually it will all start making sense. Um, I promise. Uh, it might take six or seven times. The eighth iteration, it will click together, I promise. Um, but it does need a little bit of, um, just a little bit of practice. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I do recommend just going away and having a good play around. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and, and yeah, trying out all the stuff we've gone over today and if you come across something that's like interesting you're like oh i wonder what this does um have a have a read about it um and you know have a go see what happens Git again git is really really useful at like pointing you in the right direction with stuff um so like recently i had to learn how to revert code and and uh and i had to re rebase which is like going back and like changing the git history very intimidating uh, at, at start but when I did it it went like all oh, right okay like all I've read making sense now and I, I got to practice it got to implement it and so I'll do the same with this the stuff um so yeah just go around play play around with it and nowadays usually when I'm starting a new like task or projects I will set up a git repository so even if I'm like I'm writing something um I will set up a little uh, repository. Um, like the other day, I wanted to generate QR codes, set up a repository, wrote the code there, and and did that instead of going find a website, just to practice. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it can be really good. Um, yeah, uh, Git is astonishingly. Uh, it is it, one of these things that are like you know, steep learning cur curve to sort of learn initially. Uh, mastering it is is you know uh, a, a continuous process, um, but uh, even if you get the basics, you're you're doing great. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop recording. Um, so thank you very much for attending the sort of the thing. And then if anyone wants to ask any questions after we stop recording, because they don't then be recorded, uh, you're welcome to. So I'm just going to stop now.